Trampoline by William Shakespeare, adapted by Taylor Phillips. Tonight, playing Imogen. Uh, Taylor Lynn. Playing Yakimo and second British captain. Kevin Bain. Playing Posthumus and Leonatus and Lord. Actually, it's Posthumus, Leonatus, that's one person. Playing Posthumus, Leonatus and Lord. David Mackler. Playing Belarius and Messenger. Christopher Young. Playing Cymbeline. David Mosier. Playing Queen, Cecilius Leonatus and Captain. Oh, oh Lisbo. Playing Paisa Paisanio and Jailer. Marty Goldberg. Pisanio. 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 <laughs> Playing Gidirius. Second gentleman, first lord. Oh, Shelly Spencer. <laughs> Playing Ar Arvigarus. Uh, Arvig uh, Arv Arvigarus. Arvaragus. Arvaragus. Playing Arvaragus, Frenchman, second lord. You're a singer. And attendant. <laughs> Sorry. Playing Lucius, first gentleman. Michael Genoff. Playing Cornelius, Filario, Clawton, first British captain. Thomas Kane. Act one, scene one. Britain, the garden of Cymbeline's palace. Enter first and second gentlemen. We do not meet a man but frowns. Our bloods no more obey the heavens than our courtiers. He'll seem as does the king's. But well, what's the matter? His daughter and the heir of his kingdom, whom he purposed to his wife's sole son, a widow that he late he married, hath referred herself unto a poor but worthy gentleman. She's wedded, her husband's banished, she's imprisoned. All this outward sorrow, though I think the king be touched at very heart. None but the king? He that hath lost her too, so is the queen that most desired the match, but not a courtier, although they wear their faces to the bent of the king's looks, at a heart that is not glad at the thing they scowl at. And why so? He that hath missed the princess is a thing too bad for bad report, and he that hath her, I mean that married her, alack a good man. And therefore banished is a creature such as to seek through the regions of the earth for one his like that would be something failing in him that should compare. I do not think so fair and outward in such stuff within endows a man but he. You speak him far. What's his name and birth? Ah, uh, his father was called Sicilius who did join his honor against the Romans with Cassabilian, but had his title by Antius, whom he served with glory and admired success, so gained the Sir Edition Leonatus, and had besides his gentlemen in question two other sons who in the wars of the time died with their swords in hand, but for which their father, then old and fond of issue, took such sorrow that he quit being, and his gentle lady, big of his gentleman, uh, his gentleman, our theme, deceased as he was born. The king, he takes the babe to his protection, calls him Postumus Leonatus. Reads him and makes him of his bedchamber, puts to him all the learnings of the time, and in its springs become a harvest, lived in court, which rare it is to do. Most praised, most love, a sample to the youngest, though the more mature, a glass that feeded them, and to the graver, a child that guarded dotards. To his mistress, for whom he now is banished, her own price proclaims how she esteemed him, and his virtue by her election may be truly read what kind of man he is. 
I honor him even out of your report. But pray, you tell me, is she sole child to the king? His only child. He had two sons, the eldest at three years old, in swaddling clothes, the other from their nursery were stolen, and to this hour no guess in knowledge which way they went some twenty years ago. That a king's children should be so conveyed, so slackly guarded, and the search so slow that could not trace them. Yet is it true, sir? I do well believe you. Enter the queen. Posthumus and Imogen. Here comes the gentleman, the queen and princess. We must forbear. Exeunt no. first and second gentleman. No, be assured you shall not find me, daughter, after the slander of most stepmothers. Evil eyed unto you. You're my prisoner, but your jailer shall deliver you the keys that lock up your restraint. For you, Posthumus, so soon as I can win the offended king, I will be known your advocate, Mary. Yet the fire of rage is in him, and twere good you learned unto his sentence with what patience your wisdom may inform you. Uh, please, your highness, I will from hence today. You know the peril. I'll fetch a turn about the garden. Fitting the pangs of barred affections, though the king hath charged you should not speak together. Exit queen. Oh, oh, dissembling courtesy. How fine this tyrant can tickle where she wounds. My dearest husband, I something fear my father's wrath, but nothing what his rage can do to me. You must be gone. And I shall here abide the hourly shot of angry eyes, not comforted to live, but there is this jewel in the world that I may not see again. Oh, my, my queen, my mistress, O oh, lady, weep no more, lest I give cause to be suspected of more tenderness than doth become a man. I will remain the loyalest husband that did e'er plight troth, my residence in Rome at one Filario's, who to my father was a friend, to me known but by letter, thither right, my queen, and with mine eyes I'll drink the words you send, Though ink be made of gall. Re-enter queen. Be, be brief, I pray you. If the king come, I shall incur, I know not, how much of his displeasure. <laughs> Yet I'll move him to walk this way. I never do him wrong, but he does buy my injuries. Exit queen. Adieu. Nay, stay a little. Look here, love. This diamond was my mother's. She offers a ring. Take it, heart, and keep it till you woo another wife when Imogene is dead. How? How? Another? Ah, you gentle gods, give me but this I have, and sear up my embracements from a next with bonds of death. He puts the ring on his finger. Remain, remain thou here, while sense can keep it on, and sweetest, fairest, for my sake, Wear this. He offers her a bracelet. Tis a manacle of love. I'll place it upon this fairest prisoner. He puts it on her wrist. Oh, the gods. When shall we see again? Enter Cymbeline and lords. <laughs> Alack, the king! Thou basest thing, avoid hence from my sight. If after this command thou fraught the court with thy unworthiness, thou diest away, thou art poisoned my blood. How the gods protect you and bless the good remainders of the court. I am gone. Exit posthumous. There cannot be a pinch in death more sharp than this is. This loyal thing that shouldst repair my youth Thou heaps the year's age on me. Past grace, obedience. Past hope and in despair, that way past grace. 
might have had the sole son of my queen. <laughs> oh, blessed that I might not. I chose an eagle and did avoid a putlock. Hooks the beggar, which have made my throne a, a sheep for baseness. No, I rather added a luster to it. Oh, thy vile one. Sir, it is your fault that I have loved Posthumus. You bred him as my playfellow, and he is a man worthy any woman overbuys me almost the sum he pays. Cymbeline? Oh. They were again together. You have done not after our command. Away with her and, and pen her up. Beseech your patience. Peace. Dear lady daughter, peace. Sweet sovereign, leave us to ourselves and make yourself some comfort out of your best advice. Hey, let her languish. A drop of blood a day and being aged, die of this folly. Exit Cymbeline with his lords. Fa, you must give way. Enter Pisanio. Here is your servant. How now, sir? What news? My lord, your son drew on my master. Ha! Huh? No harm, I, I trust, is done. There might have been, but that my master rather played than fought and had no help of anger. I am very glad on it. Your son's my father's friend. He takes his part to draw upon an exile? Oh, brave sir! I would they were in Africa both together, myself by with a needle, that I might prick the goer back. Why came you from your master? On his command, he would not suffer me to bring him to the haven, left these notes of what commands I should be subject to when it pleased you to employ me. This hath been your faithful servant. I dare lay mine honor, he will remain so. I humbly thank your highness. <laughs> pray, uh, walk a while. About some half hour hence, pray you speak with me. You shall at least go see my lord aboard. For this time leave me. Exeunt. Scene two, Britain, a public place. Enter Clawton with first and second lord. Sir, I would advise you to shift your shirt. The, the violence of action hath made you reek as a sacrifice. If my shirt were bloody, then to shift it. Have I hurt him? No, Faith, not so much as his patience. The villain would not stand me, and that she should love this fellow and refuse me? If it be a sin to make a true election, she is damned. Sir, as I told you always, her beauty and her brain go not together. She's a good sign, but I have seen small reflection of her wit. She shines not upon fools, lest the reflection should hurt her. Come, out to my chamber, would there have been some hurt done? I wish not so, unless it had been the fall of an ass, which is no great hurt. You'll go with us? Well, my lord. Exeunt. Scene three, Britain, a room in Cymbeline's palace. Enter Imogen and Pisanio. Imogen and Pisanio. I would thou growest unto the shores of the haven and questionest every sail. What was the last that he spake to thee? Uh, it was his queen, his queen. And then waved his handkerchief? And kissed it, madam. Ah, oh, senseless linen, happier therein than I. And that was all? No, madam, uh, for so long as he could make me with this eye or ear distinguish him from others, he did keep the deck with glove or hat or handkerchief, still waving as the fits and stirs of the minds could best express how slow his soul sailed on, how swift his ship. Thou shouldst have made him as little as a crow or less ere left to after eye him. Madam, so did I. I would have broke mine eye strings, cracked them, but to look upon him till the diminution of space had pointed him sharp as my needle. And, nay, followed him till he had melted from the smallness of a gnat to air. And then I've turned mine eye and wept. My good Pisanio, when shall we hear from him? Be assured, madam, 
with his next message. He did not take my leave of him, but had both pretty things to say. Ere I could tell him how I would think on him at certain hours, thoughts and such. Or I could make him swear that the cheese of Italy should not betray my interest in his honor. Or ere I could give him that parting kiss, which I had set betwixt two charming words, comes in my father. And like the tyrannous breathing of the north, shakes all our buds from growing. Enter attendant. Queen, madam, desires your highness company. Those things I bid you do, get them dispatched. I will attend the queen. Madam, I shall. Exeunt. Scene four, Rome, a room in Filario's house. Enter Filario, Iacimo, and a Frenchman. Believe it, sir. I have seen him written. Then a quest note. Expected to prove so worthy as since he hath been allowed the name of, but I could then have looked on him without the help of admiration, for the catalogue of his endowments have been tabled by his side, and I to pursue him by items, this matter of marrying his king's daughter, wherein he must be weighed rather by her value than his own, words him, I doubt not, a great deal from the matter. And then his banishment. Aye and the approbation of those that weep this lamentable divorce under the colors are wonderfully to extend him, but it but to fortify her judgment, which else an easy battery might lay flat for taking a beggar without less quality. But how comes it he to be sojourn with you? How creeps acquaintance? His father and I were soldiers together, to whom I have been bound, often bound no less than my life. Huh, here comes the Brighton. I beseech you all, be better known to this gentleman, whom I commend to you as noble friend of mine. How worthy he is, I will leave to appear hereafter, rather than story him in his own hearing. Sir, we have known each other in Orléans. Ah, uh, since when I have been debtor to you for courtesies, which I will be ever to pay and yet pay still. Sir, you orate my poor kindness. I was glad I did atone my countrymen and you upon the importance of so slight and trivial a nature. Uh, by your pardon, sir, I was then a young traveler, rather shunned to go even with what I heard than in my every action to be guided by others' experiences. But upon my mended judgment, if I offend not to say it is mended, my quarrel was not altogether slight. Can we with manners ask what was the difference? It was much like an argument that fell out last night, where each of us fell in praise of our country mistresses, this gentleman at that time vouching, and upon warrant of bloody affirmation, his to be more fair, virtuous, wise, chaste, constant, qualified, and less attemptable than any of the rarest of our ladies in France. That lady is not now living, or this gentleman's opinion by this worn out. Hush, she holds her virtue still, and I my mind. You must not so far prefer her for hours of Italy. Being so far provoked as I was in France, I would bait her nothing. As fair and as good, a kind of hand-in-hand -hand comparison has been something too fair and too good for any lady in Britain. If she went before others I have seen, as that diamond of yours outlust as many I have beheld, I could not but believe she excelled many, but I have not seen the most precious diamond that is, nor you, the lady. I praised her as I rated her, so do I my stone. What do you esteem it at? <laughs> More than the world enjoys. Enter your unparagon mistress is dead, or she is outprized by a trifle. You are mistaken. The one may be sold or given, or if there were wealth enough for the purchase of purchase or merit for the gift, the other is not a thing for sale, and only the gift of the gods. Which the gods have given you. Which, by their graces, I will keep. You may wear her in your title yours, but you know strange foul light upon neighboring ponds, 
Your ring may be stolen too. A cunning thief or a that way accomplished courier would hazard the winning both of first and last. <laughs> Your Italy contains none so accomplished a courtier to convince the honor of my mistress. I do nothing doubt you have store of thieves. Notwithstanding, I fear not my ring. I should get ground of your fair mistress, make her go back even to the yielding, had I admittance and opportunity to friend. <laughs> no, no. I dare thereupon pawn the moiety of my estate to your ring, which in my opinion overvalues it something, but I make my wager rather against your confidence that her reputation and to bar your offense herein too, I durst attempt it against any lady in the world. You are a good deal abused in too bold a persuasion, and I doubt not you sustain what you're worthy of by your attempt. What's that? A repulse, though your attempt, as you call it, deserve more. A punishment, too. Gentlemen, enough of this. It came in too suddenly. Let it die as it was born, and I, I pray you, be better acquainted. I will lay you ten thousand ducats to your ring that commend me to the court where your lady is, with no more advantage than opportunity of a second conference, and I will bring from thence that honor of hers which you imagine so reserved. I will wager against your gold, <laughs> gold to it, my ring I hold as dear as my finger, tis part of it. You are a friend and therein the wiser. If you buy lady's flesh at a million a dram, you cannot preserve it from tainting. But I see you have some religion in you that you fear. You bear a graver purpose, I hope. I am the master of my speeches and would undergo what's spoken, I swear. Will you? I shall but lend my diamond till your return. Let there be covenants drawn between us. My mistress exceeds in goodness the hugeness of your unworthy thinking. I dare you to this match. Here's my ring. By the gods, it is won. If I bring you no sufficient testimony that I have enjoyed the dearest bodily parts of your mistress, my 10,000 ducats are yours. So is your diamond, too. If I come off and leave her in such honor as you have trust in, she your jewel, this is your jewel, and my gold are yours, provided I have your commendation for my more free entertainment. I embrace these conditions. Let us have articles betwixt us. Only thus far you shall answer. If you make your voyage upon her, and give me directly to understand you have prevailed, I am no further your enemy. She is not worth our debate. If she remain unseduced, you not making it appear otherwise for your ill opinion and the assault you have made to her chastity, you shall answer me with your sword. Your hand, a covenant. They shake hands. We will have these things set down by lawful counsel and straight away for Britain, lest you bargain should catch cold and starve. I will fetch my gold and have our two wages recorded. Agreed. Exit Iacomo and Posthumus. Bills is hold, thank you. Signor Iacomo will not turn, will not from it. pray. Let us follow. Exeunt. Scene five, Britain. A room in Cymbeline's palace. Enter Queen and Cornelius. Now, Master Doctor, have you brought those drugs? Please, Your Highness. Aye, here they are, Madam. He hands her a small box. Hmm. But I beseech Your Grace without offense. My conscience bids me ask, wherefore you have commanded of me these most dangerous compounds? which are the movers of a languishing death, though, but though slow, deadly. I wonder, doctor, thou askest me such a question. Have I not been thy pupil long? Having thus far proceeded, unless thou thinkest me devilish, is it not me that I did amplify my judgment in other conclusions? 
I will try the forces of these thy compounds on such creatures as we count not worthy the hanging, but none human, uh, to try the vigor of them and apply uh, allailments to their act and by then gather their several virtues and effects. Your Highness shall from this practice but make hard your heart. Oh, content thee. Enter Pisanio. Here comes a flattering rascal. Upon him will I first work. He's for his master and enemy to my son. Mm. How now, Pisanio? Doctor, your, your service for the time is ended. Take you your own way. I do suspect you, madam, but you shall do no harm. Hark the word. Queen and Pisanio walk aside. I do not like her. She doth think she has strange lingering poisons. I know, I do know her spirit and will not trust one of her malice with a drug of such damned nature. Though she has will stupefy and dull the sense for a while, which first perchance she'll prove on cats and dogs, then afterward a pyre. But there is no danger in what show of death it makes, more than the locking up the spirits of time to be more fresh reviving. She is fooled with a most false aspect, and I to truer, so to be false with her. <laughs> Exit Cornelius. Weeps she still, sayest thou? Dost thou think in time she will not quench and let instructions enter where folly now possesses? Do thou work? When thou shalt bring me word she loves my son, I'll tell thee on the instant thou art then as great as in thy master, greater, for his fortunes all lie speechless, and his name is at last gasp. Return he cannot, nor continue where he is. What shall thou expect to be depender on a thing that leans? Who cannot be new built, nor has no friends? so much as but to prop him. She drops the box and Pisanio picks it up. Thou takest up, <laughs> thou knowest not what, but take it for thy labor. It is a thing I made which hath the king five times redeemed from death. I do not know what is more cordial. Pisanio tries to return the box. Nay, I pray thee take it. It, it is an earnest of a farther good that I mean to thee. Tell thy mistress how the case stands with her. Do it as from thyself. Think what a chance thou changest on, but think thou hast thy mistress still. To boot, my son, who shall take notice of thee, I'll move the king to any shape of thy preferment, such as thou desirest, and then myself, I chiefly, that set thee on the, onto this desert, am bound to load thy merit richly. Uh, call my women. Think on my words. <laughs> A sly and constant knave, not to be shaken. The agent for his master and the remembrancer of her to hold the hand fast to her lord. I have given him that which, if he take, shall quite unpeople her of legers for her sweet, and which she after, except she bend her humor, shall be assured to taste of two. We enter Pisanio with the queen's ladies carrying flowers. So, so, well done, well done. The violets, cowslips, and the primro primroses bear to my closet. Fare thee well, Pisanio. Think on my words. Exit queen with her ladies. And shall do. But when to my good lord I prove untrue, I'll choke myself. There's all I'll do for you. Exit Pisanio. Scene six, Britain. Another room in Cymbeline's palace. Enter Imogene alone. A father cruel and a stepdame false. A foolish suitor to a wedded lady that hath her husband banished. Oh, that husband. My supreme crown of grief and those repeated vexations of it. Had I been thief stone as my two brothers, happy. But most miserable is the desire that's glorious. Enter Pisanio and Yakimo. Who may this be? 
Oh, madam, a noble gentleman of Rome comes for my lord with letters. Change you, madam? The worthy Leonatus is in safety and greets your highness dearly. He gives her a letter. Thanks, good sir. You are kindly welcome. All of her that is out of door must rich. If she be furnished with a mind so rare, she is alone in the Arabian bird, and I have lost the wager. Boldness be my friend. Arm me, audacity, from head to foot, or like the Parthenian, I shall flying fight. He is one of the noblest note, to whose kindnesses I am most infinitely tied. Reflect upon him accordingly as you value your trust. Leonatus. You are welcome, worthy sir, as I have words to bid you, and shall find it so in all that I can do. Thanks, fairest lady. What are men mad? Hath nature given them eyes to see this vaulted arch and the rich crop of sea and land, which can distinguish twixt the fiery orbs above and the twin stones upon the numbered beach? And can we not partition make with spectacles so precious, twixt fair and foul. What makes your admiration? It cannot be in the eye for apes and monkeys. Twixt two such she's would chatter this way and the contemn with Mose the other, nor in the judgment for idiots in this case of favor would be wisely definite. Uh, what, dear sir, thus wraps you? Are you well? Thanks, madam. Well, beseech you, sir, desire my man's abode where I did leave him. He's strange and peevish. Continues well, my lord? His health, beseech you. Well, madam. Is he disposed to mirth? I hope he is. Exceeding pleasant. None a stranger there, so merry and so gamesome. He is called the Briton Reveller. I swear tis true, there's a Frenchman his companion, one an eminent monsieur, that it seems much loves a galleon girl at home. He furnishes the thick sighs from him, while the jolly Briton, your lord, I mean, laughs from his free lungs, cries, Oh, can my sides hold to think that man who knows by history, report, or his own proof, what woman is, yea, what she cannot choose, be must be, wills free hours languish, or assured bondage? Will my lord say so? Ay, madam, with his eyes in flood and laughter, it is a recreation to be by and hear him mock the Frenchman, but heavens know, some men are much to blame. Not he, I hope. Not he, but yet heaven's bounty towards him might be used more thankfully in himself, tis much in you, which I account his beyond all talents, whilst I am bound to wonder, I am bound to pity. Two. What do you pity, sir? Two creatures, heartily. Am I one, sir? You look on me. What rack discern you in me deserves your pity? Lamentable. What to hide me from the radiant sun and solace in the dungeon by a snuff? I pray you, sir, why do you pity me? That others do. I was about to say, enjoy your but it is an office of the gods to venge it, not mine, to speak on it. You do seem to know something of me or what concerns me. I pray you, since doubting things go ill often hurts more than to be sure they do, uh, for certainties either are past remedies or timely knowing that remedy then born, discover to me what both you spur and stop. Had I this cheek to bathe my lips upon, this hand whose touch, whose every touch would force the feeler's soul to the oath of loyalty, this object which takes prisoner the wild motion of mine eye, fixing it only here, should I damn then, slave with lips as common as the stairs that mount the capital, join gripes with hands, make hard with hourly falsehood, falsehood as with labor, then by peeping in an eye, base 
and illustrious as a smoky light that's fed with stinking tallow, it were fit that all the plagues of hell should at one time encounter such revolt. My lord, I fear, has forgot Britain. And himself. Not I inclined to this intelligence pronounce the beggary of his change, but tis your graces that from my mutest conscience, for my tongue charms this report out. Let me hear no more. O oh, dearest soul, your cause doth strike my heart with pity that doth make me sick. A lady so fair and fastened to an empty would make the greatest king double to be partnered with tomboys hired with that self-exhibition which your own coffers yield with diseased ventures that play with all your infirmities for gold which rottenness can lend nature such boiled stuff as well might poison poison be revenged or she that bore you was no queen and you recoil from your great stock. Revenged? How should I be revenged, if this be true, as I have such a heart that both mine ears must not in haste abuse? If it be true, how should I be revenged? Should he make me live like Diana's priest betwixt cold sheets, whilst he is vaulting variable ramps in your despite upon your purse? Revenge it! I dedicate myself to your sweet pleasure, more noble than that run against to your bed, and will continue fast to your affection, still close as sure. What hope is on you? Let me my service tender on your lips. Away! I do condemn mine ears that have so long attended thee. If thou wert honorable, thou wouldst have told this tale for virtue, not for such an end thou seekest, as base as strange. Thou wrongs a gentleman who is far from thy report as thou from honor, and solicits here a lady that disdains thee and the devil alike. What ho, Pisanio? The king, my father, shall be made acquainted of thy assault. What ho, Pisanio? Oh, happy Leonatus, I may say the credit that thy lady hath of thee deserves thy trust, and thy most perfect goodness her assured credit. Blessed live you long, a lady to the worthiest sir that ever country called his, and you his mistress, only for the most worthiest fit. Give me your pardon. I have spoke this to know if your affiance were deeply rooted and shall make your lord that which he is, new o'er, and he is one, the truest mannered, such a holy witch that he enchants societies into him. He sits amongst the men like a descended god. He hath a kind of honor, sets him off more than a mortal seeming, but not angry most mighty princess, that I have adventured to try your taking of a false report, which hath honored with confirmation your great judgment in the election of a sir so rare, which you know cannot err. The love I bear him made me to fan you thus, but the gods made you, unlike all others, chaffless. Pray your pardon. You make amends. All's well, sir my humble thanks. I had almost forgot to entreat your grace, but in a small request, and yet of moment too, for it concerns your lord, myself, and other noble friends, our partners in the business. And pray, what is it? Some dozen Romans of us, and your lord, the best feather of our wing, have mingled sums to buy a present for the emperor, which I, the factor for the rest, have done in France. Tis plate of rare device and jewels, of rich and exquisite form, their values great, and I am something curious, being strange, to have them in safe stowage. May it please you to take them in protection? Willingly and pawn mine honor for their safety. And since my lord hath interest in them, I will keep them in my bedchamber. They are in a trunk, attended by my men. I will make bold to send them to you only for this night. I must aboard tomorrow. 
Oh, no, no, yet not away tomorrow. Oh, I must, madam. Therefore, I shall beseech you, if you please, to greet your lord with writing. Do tonight I have outstood my time, which is material to the tender of our presence. I will write. Uh, send your trunk to me. It shall be safe kept and truly yielded you. You're very welcome. Exeunt. Act two, scene one. Britain before Cymbeline's palace. Enter Clawton with first and second lord. Was there ever a man had such luck? When I kissed the jack upon a upcast to be hid away, I had a hundred pound on it. And then a horse of jack and apes must take me up for swearing as I borrowed my notes of him and might not spend them at my pleasure. What a god he by that? You have broke his pate with your bowl. If his wit had been like him that broke it, it would have run all out. Horse and dog, I gave him satisfaction. Would he have been one of my rank, I am not vexed more at anything in the earth. Pox on it. I had rather not be so noble as I am. They dare not fight with me because of the queen, my mother. Every jack slave hath his belly full of fighting, and I must go up and down like a cock that nobody can match. You are a cock and capon too, and you crow cock with your comb on. Sayest thou? Uh, it is not fit your lordship should undertake every companion that you give offense to. No, I, I know that, but it is fit I should commit offense to my inferiors. Aye, it is fit for your lordship only. Did you hear of a stranger that's come to court tonight? stranger and i know not on it he's a strange fellow himself and knows it not there's an italian come and tis thought one of leonatus friends leonatus a banished rascal and he's another whosoever he be it is fit i went to look upon him is there no derogation in it you cannot derogate my lord you are a fool granted therefore your issues being foolish do not derogate <clears throat> come I'll go see this Italian. What I have lost today at Bowles, I'll win tonight of him. Come, go. I'll attend your lordship. Exit Clawton and First Lord. That such a crafty devil as is his mother should yield the world this ass. A woman that bears all down with her brain, and this her son cannot take two from twenty for his heart and leave eighteen. Alas, poor princess, thou divine Imogen, what thou endurest betwixt a father by thy stepdame governed, motherly, mother hourly coining plots, a wooer more hateful than the foul expulsion is of thy dear husband, that, that, than that horrid act of the divorce he'd make. The heavens hold firm the walls of thy dear honor. Keep unshaked that temple, thy fair mind, that thou mayst stand to enjoy thy banished lord and this great land. Exit second lord. Scene two, Britain, Imogen's bedchamber in Cymbeline's palace. A trunk is brought in. Enter Imogen reading in her bed. My eyes are weak. It's almost midnight. I've read three hours then. To bed. I forget the tapers. Sleep hath seized me wholly. To your protection, I commend me, gods. From fairies and the tempters of the night, guard me, beseech you. She sleeps. Yakimo emerges from the trunk. Ah. The crickets sing, and man's overlabored sense repairs itself by rest. Our Tarquin thus did softly press the rushes ere he wakened the chastity he wounded. Cytheria, how bravely thou becomest thy bed, fresh lily and whiter than the sheets that I must might touch. But kiss, one kiss, rubies unparagoned, how darely they do it. Tis her breathing that perfumes the chamber thus. The flame of the taper bows toward her and would underpeep her lids to see the enclosed lights now canopied under the windows, white and azure laced with blue of heaven's own tint. But my design to note the chamber, I will write all down. He begins to write. Such and such pictures, there the window, such the adornment of our bed, the arras, figures, why such and such, and the contents of the story. 
ah, but some natural notes about her body above 10,000 meaner movables would testify to enrich mine inventory. Oh, sleep, thou ape of death, lie dull upon her and be her sense, but as a monument, thus in a chapel lying. He begins to remove her bracelet. Come off, come off. Tis mine, and this will witness outwardly as strongly as the conscience does within to the madding of her lord. On her left breast, a mole sinks spotted like the crimson drops in the bottom of a cowslip. Here's a voucher, stronger than ever law could make. This secret will force him think I have picked the lock and taken the treasure of her honor. I have enough to the trunk again and shut the spring of it. Swift, swift, you dragons of the night, that dawning may bear the raven's eye. I lodge in fear, though this a heavenly angel, hell is here. The clock strikes. Yakimo exits into the trunk. The trunk is the trunk and bed are removed. Scene three, an antechamber adjoining Imogen's bedchamber in Cymbeline's palace. Enter Claw in with first and second lord. Your lordship is the most patient man in loss, the most coldest that ever turned up ace. It would make any man cold to lose. But not every man patient after the noble temper of your lordship. You are most hot and furious when you win. Winning will put any man into courage. If I could get this foolish image in, I should have gold enough. It's almost morning, is it not? Day, my lord. I would this music would come. I'm advised that to give her music a mornings, if they say it will penetrate. <laughs> Enter musicians. Come on, tune. If you can penetrate her with your fingering so we'll try with tongue too musicians begin to play Clawton sings hark hark the lock at heaven's gate sings and phoebus chins arise his seeds to water at those springs a chalice flowers let lies and winking merry buds begin to ope their golden eyes with everything that pretty is my lady sweet arise 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 so get you gone if this penetrates i will consider your music the better if it do not the voice of unpaved eunuch can never amend exit musicians enter cymbeline and queen with attendants here comes the king. He cannot choose but take this service I have done fatherly. Good morrow to your majesty and to my gracious mother. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear the door of our stern daughter? I have assailed her with musics, but she vouchsafes no notice. The exile of her minion is too new. She hath not yet forgot him. Some more time must wear the print of his remembrance on. And then she is yours. You are most bound to the king, who let you go by no vantages that may prefer you to his daughter. Frame yourself to orderly solicits and be friended with the aptness of the season. Make denials, increase your services. So seem as if you were inspired to do those things, those duties which you tender to her, that you in all obey her, save when command to your dism dismissions tends, and therein you are senseless. Senseless? Not so. Enter a messenger. Uh, so like you, sir, ambassadors from Rome, the one is Caius Lucius. Exit messenger. Worthy fellow, albeit he comes on angry purpose now, uh, but that's no fault of his. We must receive him according to the honor of his sender, and towards himself, his goodness forspent on us. We must extend our notice. Our dear son, 
when you have given good morning to your mistress. Attend the queen and us. We shall have need to implore you towards this Roman. Come, our queen. Exit Cymbeline and queen with first and second lord and attendants. If she be up, I'll speak with her. If not, let her lie still in dream. By your leave, ho! Good morrow, fairest sister, your sweet hand. Good morrow, sir. You lay out too much pains for purchasing but trouble. The thanks I give is telling you that I am poor of thanks and scarce can spare them. Still, I swear I love you. If you swear still, your recompense is still that I regard it not. I pray you, spare me. To leave you in your madness for my sin, I will not. Fools are not mad, folks. Do you call me fool? As I am mad, I do. And by the very truth of it, I care for you not. And am so near the lack of charity to accuse myself, I hate you. Which I'd rather you felt than make it my boast. You sin against obedience, which you owe your father for the contract you pretend with that base wretch, one bread of arms and fostered with cold dishes, with scraps of the court, it is no contract, none. And though it be allowed when meaner parties, yet who then he more mean, he to knit their souls on whom there is no more dependency, but brats and beggary in self-figured not. Yet you are cut curbed from that enlargement by the consequence of the crown. I must not foil the precious note of it with a base slave. A hiding for livery, a squire's cloth, a pantler, not so eminent. Profane fellow, wert thou the son of Jupiter, and no more but what thou art besides? Thou wert too base to be his groom. Thou wert dignified enough, even to the point of envy, if t'were made comparative for your virtues to be styled the underhangman of his kingdom, and hated for being preferred so well. The South Fog rot him. He never can meet more mischance than come to be but named of thee. His meanest garment that ever hath but clipped his body is dearer in my respect than all the hairs above thee. Were they all made such men? How now, Pisanio? Enter Pisanio. His garment? Now the devil. To Dorothy, my woman, hide thee presently. His garment? I am frighted with a fool. Frighted and angered worse. Go bid my woman search for a jewel that too casually hath left mine arm. It was thy master's. Shrew me if I would lose it for a revenue of any kings in Europe. I do think I saw it this morning. Confident I am last night was on mine arm. I, I kissed it. I hope it be not gone to tell my lord I kiss aught but he. Will not be lost. I hope so. Go and search. Exit, Pisanio. You have abused me, his meanest garment. Aye, I said so, sir. If you will make it an action, call witness to it. I will inform your father. Your mother, too. She's my good lady and will conceive, I hope, but the worst of me. So I leave you, sir, to the worst of discontent. Exit, Imogen. I'll be revenged, his meanest garment. Well. Exit Clawton. Scene four, Rome. Philario's house. Enter Posthumus and Philario. Oh, fear it not, sir. I would I were so sure to win the king as I am bold her honor will remain hers. What means do you make to him? <laughs> not any, but abide the change of time. Quake in the present winter state and wish that warmer days would come. In these feared hopes, I barely gratify your love. They failing, I must die much your debtor. Your very goodness and your company are pays it. All I can do. By this, your king hath heard of great Augustus, Gaius Lucius, will do his commission thoroughly. And I think he'll grant the tribute, send the arrearages, or look upon our Romans, whose resent remembrance is yet fresh in their grief. I do believe, statest though I am, none nor like to be, that this will prove a war. Our countrymen are men more ordered than when Julius Caesar 
smiled at their lack of skill, but found their courage worthy his frowning at. Their discipline, now winged with their courages, will make known to their approvers they are people such that mend upon the world. Enter Yakimo. See, si. Yakimo. I hope the briefness of your answer made the speediness of your return. Yakimo. Yakimo. Hello. Here are letters for you. No. What? I'm sorry. Your Dirty lady not. is one of the fairest that I have looked upon. <laughs> and therewithal the best, or let her beauty look thorough, a look through a casement to allure false hearts and be false with them. Here are letters for you. Are uh, their tenor good, I trust? Tis very long. Posthumus reads the letter. Was Gaius Lucius in the Britain court when you were there? He was expected then, but not approached. All is well yet. Sparkles this stone as it was wont, or is it not too dull for your good wearing? If I have lost it, I should have lost the worth of it in gold. I'll make a journey twice as far to enjoy a second night of such sweet shortness, which was mine in Britain, for the ring is won. The stone's too hard to come by. Not a whit. Your lady being so easy. Make not, sir, your loss your sport. I hope you know that we must not continue, friends. Good sir, we must. If you keep covenant, had I not brought the knowledge of your mistress home, I grant we were to question father, but I now profess myself the winner of her honor, together with your ring, and not the wronger of her or you, have proceeded but by both your wills. If you can make it apparent that you have tasted her in bed, my hand and ring is yours. If not, the foul opinion you had of her pure honor gains or loses your sword or mine, or masterless leave both to who shall find them. Sir, my circumstances I confirm with oath. Proceed. First, her bedchamber, where I confess I slept not, but profess had that was well worth watching. It was hanged with tapestry of silk, a piece of work so bravely done, so rich that it did strive in workmanship and value, which I wondered could be so rarely and exactly wrought since the true life on it was. Oh, this is true, and this you might have heard of her by me or by some other. More particulars must justify your knowledge or else you shall do your honor injury. The chimney is south of the chamber and the chimney piece chast Dion bathing. The roof of the chamber with golden cherubims is fretted. Her and irons, I had forgot them, were two winking cupids of silver, each one a foot standing, nicely, depending on their brands. This is her honor. Let it be granted you have seen all this, and praise be given to your remembrance. The description of what is in her chamber, nothing saves the wager you have laid. Then, if you can, be pale. I beg but leave to air this jewel. See? He shows the bracelet. And now tis up again. It must be married to that your diamond. I'll keep them. Jove! <laughs> Once more let me behold it. Is it that which I left with her? Sir, I thank her that. She stripped it from her arm. I see her yet. Her pretty action did outsell her gift, and yet enriched it too. She gave it to me and said she prized it once. Ooh. Maybe she plucked it off to send it me. She writes so to you, doth she? Oh, no, no, no. Tis true. Here, take this too. He gives Yakimo the ring. It is a basilisk unto mine eye. Kills me to look on it. 
Let there be no honor where there is beauty, truth where semblance, love where there's another man. And the vows of women are of no more bondage be to where they are made than they are to their virtues, which is nothing. <laughs> oh, above measure, false. Have patience, sir, and take your ring again. Tis not yet won. It may be probable she lost it, or who knows if one her women being corrupted has stolen it from her. Very true. And so I hope he came by it. Uh, back my ring. <laughs> by Jupiter, I had it from her arm. <laughs> Hark you, he swears. By Jupiter, he swears. Tis true. <laughs> Nay, keep the ring, tis true. She would not lose it. Her attendants are all sworn and honorable. They induced to steal it, and by a stranger? No, he hath enjoyed her. The cognizance, the cognizance of her inconstancy is this. She hath bought the name of whore thus dearly. There, take thy hire, and all the fiends of hell divide themselves among you. Oh, oh, sir, be patient. This is not strong enough to be believed of one persuaded well of. If you seek for further satisfying, under her breast, worthy the pressing lies a mole, right proud of that most delicate lodging. But my life, I kissed it, and it gave me present hunger to feed again, <sighs> though full. You do remember this stain upon her? Aye, and it doth confirm another stain as big <laughs> as hell can hold, were there no more but it. Will you hear more? Spare your arithmetic. Never count the turns. Once and a million. I'll be sworn. No swearing. <laughs> If you will swear you have not done it, you lie, and I will kill thee if thou dost deny thou hast made me cuckold. I'll deny nothing. Oh, that I had her here to tear her limb meal. I will go there and do it in the court before her father. I'll do something. Exit posthumous. Quite beside the government of patience, you have won. Let's follow him and pervert the present wrath he hath against himself. With all my heart. Exeunt, scene five, Rome. Another room in Filario's house. Enter Posthumus. There no way for men to be, but women must be half workers. We are all bastards. And that most venerable man, which I did call my father, was I know not where when I was stamped. Some coiner with his tools made me a counterfeit. Yet my mother seemed the Diane of that time. So doth my wife, the nonpareil of this. Oh, vengeance, vengeance! Me of my lawful pleasure, she restrained and prayed me off forbearance. I did it with a prudency so rosy, the sweet view on it might well have warmed old Saturn that I thought her as chaste and unsunned as snow. Oh, all the devils! This yellow lacamo in an hour, was it not? Or less! At first, perchance he spoke not, but like a full acorned boar, a German one, cried, oh, and mounted found no opposition, but what he looked for should oppose, and she should from encounter guard. Could I find out the woman's part in me, for there's no motion that tends to vice in man, but I affirm it is the woman's part, be it lying, note it, the woman's. <laughs> yeah, note it, the woman's, flattering hers, deceiving hers, lust and rank thoughts, hers, hers. Revenge is hers, ambitions, covetings, change of prides, disdain, 
Nice longing, slanders, mutability, all faults that have a name. Nay, the hell knows why hers in part or all, but rather all, or even to vice, they are not constant. They are changing still one vice, but of a minute old for one, not half as old as that. I'll write against them, detest them, curse them. Yet tis greater skill in a true hate to pray they have their will. The very devils cannot plague them better. Exit Posthumus. Act three, scene one. Britain, a hall in Cymbeline's palace. Enter in state, Cymbeline, Queen, Clawton, and Lords at one door, and at another, Caius Lucius and attendants. I say, what would Augustus Caesar with us? When Julius Caesar was in this Britain and conquered it, Casabile and thine uncle famous in Caesar's praises, no with less than in his feats preserving it, for him and his succession granted Rome a tribute. Nearly 3,000 pounds, which by thee lately is left unfendered. And to kill the marvel shall be ever so. Britain is a world by itself, and we will nothing pay for wearing our own noses. That opportunity, which then they had to take from us to resume, we have again. Remember, sir, my liege, the kings, your ancestors, together with the natural bravery of your isle, which stands as Neptune's park, ribbed and pallid, in with rocks unscalable and roaring waters, with sands that will not bear your enemies' boats, but suck them up to the top post. Mast, a kind of conquest Caesar made here, but made not hear his brag of come and saw and overcome with shame, the first that ever touched him. He was carried from off our coast, twice beaten. Come now, our kingdom is stronger than it was at that time. And as I say, there, are no, there is no more such Caesars. Other of them may have crooked noses, but to owe such straight ones, none. Um, let your mother end. Sir, you must know, till the injurious Romans did extort this tribute from us, we were free. Caesar's ambition, which swelled so much that it did almost stretch the sides of the world against all color here, did put the yoke upon us, which, to shake off, becomes a warlike people whom we reckon ourselves to be. I am sorry. The line that I am to pronounce Augustus Caesar. Caesar, that, that hath more kings his servants than thyself, domestic office, officers, thine enemy. Receive it from me, then. War and confusion in Caesar's name pronounce I against thee. Look for fury not to be resisted. Thou defied, I thank thee for myself. Thou art welcome, Chaos. His Majesty bids you welcome. Make pastime with us a day or two, or longer. If you seek us afterwards in other terms, you shall find us in our salt water girdle. If you beat us out of it, it is yours. If you fall in the adventure, our crows shall fare the better for you. And there's an end. So, sir. I know your master's pleasure and he mine. All the remain is welcome. Exeunt. Scene two, Britain. A room in Cymbeline's palace. Enter Pisanio reading of a letter. How? Of adultery? Wherefore write you not what monsters her accuse? Leonatus, O oh master, what a strange infection is fallen into thy ear. What false Italian, as poisonous tongue, as handed hath prevailed on thy too ready hearing. 
disloyal. No, she's punished for her truth and undergoes more goddess-like than wife-like such assaults as would take in some virtue. O oh, my master, thy mind to her is now as low as were thy fortunes. How? That I should murder her upon the love and truth and vows which I hath made to thy command. I her, her blood. If it be so to do good service, never let me be counted serviceable. How look I that I should seem to lack humanity so much as this fact comes to? Do it, the letter that I have sent her by her own command shall give thee opportunity. Oh, damned paper, lack as the ink that's on thee. Enter Imogen. Lo, here she comes. I am ignorant in what I am commanded. How now, Pisanio? Madam, here is a letter from my lord. He gives her a paper. Who? Thy lord that is my lord? Oh, you good gods, let what is here contain relish of love, of my lord's health, of his contents. Uh, yet not that we two are asunder. Let that grieve him. Just she, opens, she opens the letter. Justice in your father's wrath, should he take me in his dominion, could not be so cruel to me as you, O oh, the dearest of creatures, would even renew me with your eyes. Take notice that I am in Cambria and Milford Haven. What your own love will out of this advise you, follow. So he wishes you all happiness that remains loyal to his vow, and you in increasing in love. Leonatus Posthumus. Ah, for a horse with wings! Here is that, Pisanio? He is at Milford Haven. Uh, read, and tell me how far it is thither. If one of mean affairs may plot it in a week, why may not I glide thither in a day? Then true, Pisanio, who longs like me to see thy lord, who longs, no, let me bait, but not like me, yet longest in a fainter kind. Oh, not like me, for mine's beyond, beyond. Uh, say how far it is to the same blessed Milford. But most of all, how we may steal from hence, and, and for the gap that we shall make in time from our hence going and our return, to excuse. Uh, but first, how get hence? Why should excuse be born or heir be got? We'll talk of that hereafter. Prithee, speak. How many score of miles may we well ride twixt hour and hour? Uh, one score twixt sun and sun, madams, enough for you. And two, much too. Why, one that rode to his execution, man, could never go so slow. But we waste time. And go, bid my woman feign a sickness, say she'll home to her father, and provide me presently a riding suit no costlier than would fit a Franklin's huswife. Madam, your best consider. I see before me, man. Away, I prithee. Do as I bid thee. There's no more to say. Accessible is none but Milford Way. Exeunt. Scene three, Wales. A mountainous country with a cave. Enter from the cave. Olarius as Morgan. Gideris as Polydor. And Arvigarus as Cadwall. A goodly day not to keep house with such whose roof is low as ours. Stoop, boys! Gates of monarchs are arched so high that giants may jet through and keep their imperious turbans on without good morrow to the sun. Hell, fair heaven, we house in the rocks, yet use thee not so hardly as prouder livers do. Hail heaven. Hail heaven. <laughs> now for our mountain sport. Up to yon hill, your legs are young, I'll tread these flats. Consider, when you perceive me like a crow, that it is the place which lessens and sets off. And you may revolve what tales I have told you of courts, of princes, of the tricks in war. This service is not service so being done, but being so allowed. To apprehend thus draws us a profit from all things we see, and oft to our comforts. Oh, this life is nobler than attending for a, for a, uh, a cheek. 
richer than doing nothing for a robe, prouder than rustling in unpaid for silk, such gain the cap of him that makes him fine, yet keeps his book uncrossed. No life to ours. Out of your proof you speak. We poor unfledged have never winged from view of the nest, nor know not what airs from home. What should we speak of when we are as old as you? When we shall hear the rain and wind beat dark December, how in this our pinching cave shall we discourse the freezing hours away? We have seen nothing. We are beastly, subtle as the fox for prey, like warlike as the wolf for what we eat. Our valor is to chase what flies. Our cage we make a choir, as doth a prisoned bird, and sing our bondage freely. Oh, you speak. Did you but know the city's usuries and felt them knowingly? The art of the court, as hard to leap as keep, whose top to climb is certain falling, or so slippery that the fear's as bad as falling. The toil of war, a pain that only seems to seek out danger in the name of fame and honor, which dies in the search and has oft a slanderous epitaph as record of fair act. Oh, boys, this story world may read in me. My body's marked with Roman swords, and my report was once first with the best of note. Cymbeline loved me, and when a soldier's was the, was the, when a, and when a soldier was the theme, my name was not far off. Then was I as a tree whose bows did bend with fruit, but in one night a storm or a robbery, call it what you will, shook down my mellow hangings, nay, my leaves, and left me bare to weather. Uncertain favor. My fault being nothing, as I told you oft, but the two villains whose false oaths prevailed before my perfect honor swore to Cymbeline I was a confederate with the Romans. So followed my banishment. And this twenty years, this rock, these domains have been my world, where I have lived at honest freedom, paid more pious debts to heaven than in all the fore end of my time. Uh, but, but up to the mountains, this is not hunter's language. He that strikes the first venison shall be the lord of the feast, and to him the other two shall minister. We fear no poison which attends in place or greater state. I'll meet you in the valleys. Exit Guiderius and Arvirius. <laughs> <laughs> How hard it is to hide the sparks of nature. These boys know little. They are sons to the king. No Cymbeline dreams that they are alive. They think they are mine. And though trained up this, up thus meaningly in the caves wherein they bow, their thoughts do hit the roofs of palaces, and nature prompts them in simple and low things to prince it much beyond the trick of others. There's Polydor, the heir of Cymbeline and Britain, and the king his father called Guiderius, Jove, where on my three-foot stool I sit and tell thee the warlike feats I have done. His spirits fly out into my story, say, thus mine enemy fell, and thus I set my foot on his neck, and even then the princely blood flows in his cheeks. He sweats, strains his young nerves, and puts himself in posture that acts my words. Younger brother, Cadwall, once Aravegus, in as like a figure strikes life into my speech and shows much more his own conceiving. Hark. Huh. The game is roused. All Cymbeline heaven and my conscience knows thou did unjustly banish me, whereon and three and two years old I stole these babies, thinking to bar thee of secession as thou refts me of my lands. But here and now, myself, Belarius, that am Morgan called, they take me for natural father. The game is up. Exit Belarius. Scene four, the country near Milford Haven. Enter Pisanio and Imogen. 
Thou toldst me when we came from horse the place was near at hand. Ne'er longed my mother so to see me first as I have now. Zaniel, man, where is Posthumus? What is in thy mind that makes thee stare thus? Wherefore breaks that sigh from the inward of thee? Sir, put thyself in a havior of less fear, ere wildness vanquish my stater senses. What's the matter? Pisanio hands her a paper. Why tenderest thou that paper to me with a look untender? My husband's hand? That drug-damned Italy hath out craftied him, and he's at some hard point. Speak, man. Thy tongue may take off some extremity, which to read would be even mortal to me. Uh, uh, please, you read, and you shall find me, wretched man, a thing the most disdained of fortune. <clears throat> Thy mistress, Pisanio, hath played the strumpet in my bed. I speak not out of weak surmises, but from proof as strong as my grief, and as certain as I expect my revenge. That part thou, Pisanio, must act for me, if thy faith be not tainted with the breach of hers. Let thine own hands take away her life. I shall give thee opportunity at Milford Haven. She hath my letter for the purpose, where if thou fear to strike, and to make me certain it is done, thou art the pander to her dishonor, and equally to me disloyal. What shall I need to draw my sword? The paper hath cut her throat already. No, to slander, whose edge is sharper than the sword, whose tongue outvenoms all the worms of Nile, whose breath rides on the posting winds, and doth belie all corners of the world. What cheer, madam? False to his bed. What is it to be false? To lie in watch there and to think on him? To weep twixt clock and clock. If sleep charge nature, to break it with a fearful dream of him and cry myself awake? That's false to his bed, is it? I? False? Thy conscious witness! Oh, Yakimo, thou didst accuse him of incontinency. Thou then looks like a villain. Now, methinks, thy fate is good enough. Some Jay of Italy, whose mother was her painting, has betrayed him. For I am stale, a garment out of fashion, and for I am richer than to hang by the walls, I must be ripped to pieces with me. Ah, oh, men's vows are women's traitors. All good seeming by thy revolt, a husband shall be thought, put on for villainy, not born where it grows, but worn a bait for ladies. So thou posthumous, but lay the leaven on all proper men. Goodly and gallant shall be false and perjured from thy great fall. Come, fellow, be thou honest. Do thou master's bidding. When thou seest him, a little witness to my obedience. Look, I draw the sword myself. She draws Pisanio's sword from its scabbard and hands it to him. Take it. And hit the innocent mansion of my love, my heart. Fear not, tis empty of all things but grief. My master's not there, who was indeed the riches of it. Do his bidding. Strike. Thou mayst be valiant in a better cause, but now thou seems a coward. Pisanio throws down the sword. Hence, vile instrument, thou shalt not damn my hand. Why, I must die. And if I do not by thy hand, thou art no servant of thy masters. Against self-slaughter there is a prohibition so divine that cravens my weak hand. Come, here's my heart. Something's a forehead. Soft, soft, will no defense. Obedient as the scabbard, what is here? She takes papers from her bodice. The scriptures of the loyal Leonatus all turn to heresy? Away, away! She throws away the letters. Corruptors of my faith, you shall no more be stomachers to my heart. Thus may poor fools believe false teachers. 
Though those that are betrayed do feel the treason sharply, yet the traitor stands in worst case of woe. And thou, Posthumus, that did set up my disobedience against the king, my father, and make me put into contempt these suits of princely fellows, shall hereafter find it is no act of common passage, but a strain of rareness. And I grieve myself to think that when thou shalt be disedged by her, that now thou tirest on, how thy memory will then be panged by me. Pretty. Dispatch. The lamb entreats the butcher. Where's thy knife? Thou art too slow to do thy master's bidding when I desire it too. Oh, gracious lady, since I received command to do this business, I have not slept one wink. Do it into bed then. I'll wake mine eyeballs out first. Wherefore then didst undertake it? Why hast thou abused so many miles with a pretense? This place, fine action, and I know. My horses labored, the time inviting thee? <clears throat> but to win time, I have considered of a course. Lady, hear me with patience. Talk thy tongue weary, speak. I have heard I am a strumpet, and mine ear there in false struck can take no greater wound. I thought you would not back again. Most like bringing me here to kill me. Not so, neither. But if I were as wise as honest, then my purpose would prove well. It cannot be but that my master is abused. Some villain I, and singular in his art, hath done you both this cursed injury. Some Roman courtesan? No, on my life. I'll give but notice you are dead, and send him some bloody sign of it, for it is commanded I should do so. You shall be missed at court, and that will well confirm it. <laughs> oh, I good fellow, what shall I do the while? If not at court, then not in Britain must you bide. Where then? Nay, think of other place. The ambassador Lucius, the Roman, comes to Milford Haven tomorrow. Now, if you could wear a mind dark as your fortune is, and but disguise that which appeareth itself must not yet be, but by self-danger, you should tread a course pretty and full of view. Yea, happily near the residence of Posthumus, so nigh at least, that though his actions were not visible, yet report should render him hourly to your ear as truly as he moves. For such means, though peril to my modesty, not death on it I would adventure. Well then, here's the point. You must forget to be a woman, change command into obedience, fear and niceness, the handmaids of all women, or more truly, woman it pretty self into waggish courage ready in jibes quick answered saucy and as quarrelous as the weasel nay you must forget the rarest treasure of your cheek exposing it but oh the harder heart alack no remedy to the greedy touch of common kissing titan and forget your dainty trims make yourself but like one for thinking this, I have already fit. Tis in my cloak, bag, doublet, hat, hose, all that answer to them. Would you, in their serving, and with what imitation you can borrow from youth or of such a season, for noble Lucius, present yourself, desire his service, tell him wherein you're happy, which will make him know that if that his head have ear in music, doubtless with joy he will embrace you for he's honorable, and doubling that most holy. Your means abroad, you have me rich, and I will never fail, beginning nor supplement. Imogen takes the cloak bag. Thou art all the comfort the gods will diet me with. Prithee, away. There's more to be considered, but we'll leave in all that good time will give us. This attempt I am soldier to. And will abide it with the prince's courage. Away, I prithee. Well, madam, we must take a short farewell, least 
being missed, I be suspected of your carriage from the court. My noble mistress, here is a box. I had it from the queen. He hands her the box. What's in it is precious. If you are sick at sea or stomach qualmed at land, a dram of this will drive away distemper to some shade and fit you to your manhood. May the gods direct you to the best. Amen. I thank thee. Exeunt. Scene five, Britain, a room in Cymbeline's palace. Enter Cymbeline, queen, Clouton, Lucius, lords and attendants. <laughs> My emperor hath wrote, I must from hence, and am right sorry that I must report you my master's enemy. Our subjects, sir, will not endure his yoke. So, sire, I, I desire a conduct overland to Milford Haven. My lords, you are appointed for that office. The due of honor is no point omit. So, farewell, noble Lucius. Your hand, my lord. Receive it friendly, but from this time forth I wear it as your enemy. Sir, the event is yet to name the winner. Fare you well. Leave not the worthy Lucius, good my lords till he have crossed the seven, seven. Happiness. Exit Lucius and Lords. He goes hence frowning, but it honors us that we have given him cause. Tis all the better. Your valiant brightens have their wishes in it. Lucius hath wrote already to the emperor how it goes here. It fits us, therefore rightly, our chariots and our Horsemen be in readiness. The powers that he already hath in Gallia will soon be drawn to head from whence he moves his war for Britain. It is not sleepy business, but must be looks to splendid uh, speedily and strongly. Our expectation that it would be thus hath made us forward. But, my gentle queen, where is our daughter? She hath not appeared before the Roman, nor to us have tendered the duty of the day. Uh, she looks us like a, a thing more made of malice than of duty. Uh, we have noted it. Uh, call her before us, for we have been too slight in sufferance. Since the exile of Posthumus, most retired hath she her life been. The cure whereof, my lord, Tis time must do. Beseech your majesty, forbear sharp speeches to her. She's a lady, so tender of rebukes that words are strokes and strokes death to her. Re-enter the attendant. Where is he, sir? How can her attempt contempt be answered? Please you, sir, her chambers are all locked, and there's no answer that will be given to the loudest noise we make. My lord. When last I went to visit her, she prayed me to excuse her keeping close, whereto constrained by her infirmity she should that duty leave unpaid to you, which daily she was bound to proffer. This she wished me to make known, but our great court made me to blame in memory. Her doors locked, not seen of late. Grant heavens, that which I fear prove false. Exit Cymbeline with attendant. Son, I say, follow the king. That man of hers, Pisanio, her old servant, I have not seen these two days. Go, look after. Exit Clawton. Pisanio, thou that standest so for Posthumus, he hath a drug of mine. I pray his absence proceed by swallowing that, for he believes it is a thing most precious. <laughs> but for her... Where is she gone? Happily despair hath seized her, or winged with fervor of her love, she's flown to her desired Possumus. Gone she is to death or to dishonor, and my end can make good use of either. She being down, I have the placing of the British crown. Re-enter Clawton. 
How now, my son? Tis certain she is fled. Go in, cheer the king. He rages. None dare come about him. All the better. May this night forestall him of the coming day. Exit queen. I love and hate her, for she's fair and royal, and that she hath all courtly parts more exquisite than lady, lady's woman. From every one the best she hath, and she of all compounded, outsells them all. I love her therefore, but disdaining me and throwing favors on that low posthumous, slender so her judgment that what else is else rare is choked. And in that point I conclude to hate her, may indeed to be revenged upon her. Enter Pisanio. Who is here? Come hither. Oh, you precious pander. Villain, where is thy lady? In a word, or else thou art straight away with the fiends. He draws his sword. Oh, good my lord. I will not ask again. Close, villain. I'll have this secret from thy heart, or rip thy heart to find it. Is she with Posthumus, from whom so many weights of baseness cannot a dram of worth be drawn? Alas, my lord, how can she be with him? When was she missed? He is in Rome. Where is she, sir? Come nearer, no further halting. Satisfy me home, what is become of her? Oh, my all-worthy lord. All-worthy villain. Discover where thy mistress is at once, at the next word. No more of worthy lord. Speak, or thy silence on the instant is the condemnation, thy condemnation, and thy death. Then, sir, this paper is the history of my knowledge. Touching her flight. He gives Claude in a paper. Let's see it. I will pursue her even to Augustus's throne. Or this, or perish. She's far enough, and what he learns by this may prove his travail, not her danger. Hmm. I'll write to my lord she's dead. O oh, Imogene, safe mayest thou wander, safe return again. Sirrah, is this letter true? Sir, as I think. It is Posthumus's hand, I, I know it. Sirrah, if thou wouldst not be a villain, but do me true service, undergo those employments wherein I should have cause to use thee with a serious industry. That is, what villainy swear I bid thee to do to perform it directly and truly. Thou shouldst neither want my means for thy relief, nor my voice for thy preferment. Well, my good lord. Wilt thou serve me? Sir, I will. Give me the hand. Here's my purse. He gives him money. Hast any of the late master's garments in thy possession? I have, my lord, at my lodging, the same suit he wore when he took leave of my lady and mistress. The first service thou dost me, fetch that suit hither. I shall, my lord. Exit Pisanio. Meet thee at Milford Haven. <laughs> Even there, thou villainous posthumous, will I kill thee. She said upon a time, the bitterness of it I now belch from my heart. The, she held the very garment of Posthumus in more respect than my noble and natural person, together with the adornment of my qualities. With that suit upon my back will I ravish her. First kill him, and in her eyes there shall she see my valor, which will then be a torment to her contempt. He on the ground, my speech of insultment, ended on his dead body, and when my lust hath dined, which is, as I say, to vex her, I will execute in the clothes she so praised. To the court, I'll knock her back, put her home again. She hath despised me rejoicingly, and I'll be merry in my revenge. Re-enter Pisanio with the clothes. Be those the garments? I, my noble lord. How long is tis she went to Milford Haven? Uh, she can scarce be there yet. Bring this apparel to my chamber. That is the second thing that I have commanded thee. 
The third is that thou wilt be a voluntary mute to my design. Be but duteous and true performant shall tender the, itself to thee. My revenge is now at Milford. Would I had wings to follow it. Come and be true. Exit Clawton. Thou biddest me to my lost, for true to thee were to prove false, which I will never be to him that is most true. To Milford go, and find not her whom thou pursuest. Flow, flow, you heavenly blessings on her. This fool speed be crossed with slowness. Labor be his meed. Exit Pisanio. Scene six, Wales, before Belarius's cave. Enter Imogen alone, dressed as a boy. See, a man's life is a tedious one. I have tired of myself, and for two nights together have made the ground my bed. I should be sick, but that my resolution helps me. Milford, when from the mountain top Pisanio showed thee, thou wast within a ken. Oh, Jove, I think foundations fly the wretched. Such, I mean, where they should be believed. And two beggars told me I could not miss my way. Will poor folks lie? And have afflictions on them, knowing tis a punishment on trial? Yes, no wonder when rich ones scarce tell true. To lapse in fullness is sore than to lie for need, and falsehood is worse in kings than beggars. My dear Lord, thou art one of the false ones. But what is this? There is a path to it. It is some savage hold. I were best not call. I dare not call. Yet famine, ere clean and overthrow nature, makes it valiant. Oh, who's here? If anything, that civil speak. If savage take or lend. No. Oh. No answer? Then I'll enter. Best draw my sword. And if mine enemy but fear the sword like me, I'll scarcely look on it. Such a foe, good heavens. She draws her sword. Exit Imogen into the cave. Enter Belarius as Morgan, Gideris as Polydor, and Arvigarus as Cadwall. You, Polydor, have proved best woodsman and our master of the feast. Cadwall and I will play the cook and servant. Tis our match. I am thoroughly weary. I am weak with toil, yet strong in appetite. There's cold meat in the cave. We'll browse on that whilst what we have killed be cooked. Stay. Come not in. What's the matter, sir? By Jupiter. An angel. Or if not, an earthly paragon. Behold divineness no elder than a boy. Re-enter Imogen as Fideli from the cave. Good masters, harm me not! Before I entered here, I called, and thought to have begged or bought what I have took. Good troth, I have stole not, nor would not. Here's money for my meat. She offers money. I would have left it on the board as I had made my meal, and departed with prayers for the provider. Money? Youth? All gold and silver rather turn to dirt, as tis no better reckoned, but of those who worship dirty gods. I see you're angry. No, if you kill me for my fault, I should have died had I not made it. With a bound. To Milford Haven. What is your name? Fideli, sir. I have a kinsman who is bound for Italy. He embarked at Milford, to whom being going, almost spent with hunger, I am fallen in this offense. Prithee, fair youth. Think us no churls, nor measure our good minds by this rude place we live in. Well encountered. Tis almost night, you shall have better cheer ere you depart, and thanks to stay and eat it. Boys, bid him welcome. I'll make to my comfort. He is a man, I'll love him as my brother. And such a welcome as I'd give to him after long absence, such as yours. Most welcome. Be sprightly, for you fall amongst friends. Amongst friends, if brothers, but it had been so that they had been my father's sons. 
Then had my prize been less and so more equal ballasting to thee, Posthumus. He brings its son to stress. Would I could free it. Hark, boys. They talk aside. Great men, and had a court no bigger than this cave, that did attend themselves and had the virtue which their own conscience sealed them, laying by that nothing gift of differing multitudes, could not outpeer these twain. Pardon me, gods. I had changed my sex to be companion with them since Leonidas false. It shall be so, boys. Well, go dress our hunt. Fair youth, come in. Discourse is heavy fasting. When we have supped, we'll mannerly demand thee of thy story, so far as thou wilt speak it. Thanks, sir. Good night to the owl, and morn to the lark, less welcome. Exeunt. Act four. Scene one, Wales. The forest near Valerius' cave. Enter Clawton alone, dressed in posthumous' garments. I am near to the place where thy play should meet. If Pisanio hath mapped it truly, how fit his garments serve me? Why should his mistress not be fit too? I dare speak it to myself, for it is not vainglory for a man in his glass to confer on his own chamber. <laughs> I mean, the lines of my body are as well drawn as his, no less young, more strong. Not beneath him in fortunes, beyond him in the advantage of the time, above him in birth, alike conversant in general services, and more remarkable in single oppositions. Yet this imperceverant thing loves him in my despite. What mortality is? Posthumous. Thy head, which now is growing upon thy shoulders, shall within this hour be off thy mistress enforced, thy garments cut to pieces before thy face, and all this done, spurn her home to her father, who may haply be a little angry or my so rough usage, but my mother, having power of his testiness, shall turn all into my commendations. Out sword, and to a sore purpose, Fortune put them into my hand. This is the very description of their meeting place, and the fellow dares not deceive me. <laughs> he draws the sword. sword and exits. Scene two, before Valerius's cave. Enter Valerius as Morgan, Gilderus as Polydor, Argus as Cadwall, and Imogene and Fidel from the cave. You are not well. Remain here in the cave. We'll come to you after hunting. Go you to hunting. I'll abide with him. I am not well, but please you to leave me. Stick to your journal course. The breach of custom is breach of all. I am ill, but your being by me cannot amend me. Society is no comfort to one not sociable. I am not very sick, since I can reason of it. Pray you trust me here. I'll rob none but myself, and let me die stealing so poorly. I love thee. I, I have spoken. How, how much the quantity, the weight, as much as I do love my father. What? How? How? If it be sin to say so, sir, I yoke me in my good brother's fault. I know not why I love this youth, and I have heard you say love's reasons without reason. The beer at door and a demand who is shall die, I'd say my father, not this youth. Oh, noble strain. Oh, worthiest of nature, breed of greatness. Cowards father cowards, and base things sire base. Nature hath meal and brand, contempt and grace. I am not their father, but who this should be doth miracle itself loved before me the ninth hour of the morn. Brother, farewell. I wish you sport. Your health, so please you, sir. We'll leave you for this time. Go in and rest. We'll not be long away. Pray, be not sick, for you must be our housewife. <laughs> well or ill, I am bound to you. And shall be ever. These are kind creatures. 
gods, what lies I have heard. Our courtiers say all savage but at court. Experience, oh, thou disprovest report. The imperious seas breed monsters, for the dish pour tributary rivers as sweet fish. I am sick still, heart sick. Bassanio, I'll now taste of thy drug. She swallows the drug. Imogen exits to the cave. I could not stir him. He said he was gentle, but unfortunate. Just honestly afflicted, but yet honest. This youth, however distressed, appears he hath had good ancestors. Nobly he yokes, a smiling with a sigh, as if the sigh was that it was for not being such a smile, the smile mocking the sigh. I do note that grief and patience rooted in them both mingle their spurs together. Grow patience, and let the sinking elder grief untwine his perishing root with the increasing vine. It's a great morning. Come, away. Exit Cloton. Cloton. Who's there? I cannot find these runagates. That villain hath mocked me. I am faint. Those runagates? Means he not us? I partly know him. Tis Cloton, the son of the queen. Fearsome ambush, I saw him not these many years, and yet I know tis he. We are held as outlaws, hence. He is but one. You, you and my brother search. What companies are near? Pray you away. Let me alone with him. Exeunt Bellarius as Morgan, Antivirius as Cadwell, Gieterus as Polydor approaches Clotin. Soft, what are you that fly me thus? Some villain mountaineers? I have heard of such. What slave art thou? A thing more slavish did I ne'er than answering a slave without a knock. Thou art a robber, a lawbreaker, a villain. Yield thee, thief. To who? To thee? What art thou? Have not I an arm as big as thine, a heart as big? Thy words, I grant, are bigger, for I wear not my dagger in my mouth. Say what thou art, why I should yield to thee. Thou villain base, knowest me not by my clothes? No, nor thy tailor, rascal. <laughs> Who is thy grandfather? He made those clothes, which, as it seems, make thee. Thou art some fool. I am loath to beat thee. Thou injurious thief, hear but my name and tremble. What is thy name? Cloten, thou villain. I cannot tremble at it. Were it toad or adder, spider, could move me sooner. To thy further fear, thou shalt know I am son to the queen. I am sorry for it, not seeming so worthy as thy birth. Art not afraid? Those that I reverence, those I fear. The wise. At fools I laugh, not fear them. <laughs> Die the death. When I have slain thee with my proper hand, I'll follow those that even now fled hence, and on the gates of Ludstown set your heads. Yield, rustic mountaineer! Exit Clawton and Gideris as Polydor fighting. Re-enter Bellarius as Morgan and are vigorous as Cadwell. No companies abroad. None in the world. You did mistake him, sure. I cannot tell long it is since I saw him, but time hath nothing blurred those lines of favor which then he wore. I am thus absolute. Twas very clotted. In this place we left them. I wish my brother make good time with him. You say he is so fell. Being scarce made up, I mean to man, he had not apprehension of roaring terrors. Re enter Gideris as Polydor carry Cloton's head. But see, thy brother. This Cloton was a fool, an empty purse. <laughs> <laughs> there was no money in it. Not Hercules could have knocked out his brains, for he had none. Yet <laughs> I, not doing this, the fool had borne my head as I do his. What hast thou done? I am perfect, what? 
cut off one Cloton's head, son to the queen, after his own report, who called me traitor mountaineer and swore with his own single hand he'd take us in, displace our heads where, thank the gods, they grow, and set them on Ludstown. We are undone. Why, worthy father, what, what have we to lose but that he swore to take our lives? The, the law protects not us. Then why should we be tender to let an arrogant piece of flesh threaten us, play judge and executioner all himself, for we do fear the law? What, what company discover you abroad? No single soul can we set eye on, but in all safe reason, he must have some attendance. Though his humor was nothing but mutation, not frenzy, not absolute madness, co could so have raved to bring him here alone. On the good ground we fear. If we do fear, this body hath tail more perilous than the head. Let ordinance come as the gods foresay it. Howsoe'er, my brother hath done well. With his own sword, which he did wave against my throat, I have taken his head from him. I'll throw it in the creek behind our rock and let it to sea and tell the fishes he's the queen's son, Cloden. <laughs> That's all I wreck. Exit Gideris as Polydor. Fear where it will be revenged. But Polydor, thou hadst not done thy valor becomes thee well enough. What I had done, so the revenge alone pursued me. Polydor, I love thee brotherly, but envy much thou hast robbed me of this deed. I would revenges that possible strength might meet would seek us through and put us to our answer. Well, tis done. We'll hunt no more today, nor seek for danger where there's no profit. I prithee, to our rock. You and Fideli play the cooks. I'll stay till hasty Polydor return and bring him to dinner presently. For sick Fideli, I'll willingly to him. Exit RV Virigus as Cadwell. O oh, thou goddess, thou divine nature, thou thyself, thou blazonest in these two princely boys. They are as gentle as ziphers blowing in the, below the violet, not wagging his sweet head, and yet as rough. Their royal blood in chafed and rutched wind that by the top doth take the mountain pine and make him stoop to the vale. Tis wonder that an invisible instinct should frame them to royalty unlearned, honor untaught, civility not seen from the other, valor that grow that wildly grows them in wildly grows in them, but yields a crop as if it had been sowed. But still it is strange what Clotten's being here to us portends, or what his death will bring us. Re-enter Gideris as Polydor. Where is my brother? I have sent Cloton's clodpole down the stream in embassy to his mother. His body's hostage for his return. <laughs> Solemn music plays from inside the cave. Ah, my ingenious instrument. Hark, Polydor, it sounds. What occasion? Hath called well now to give it motion. Hark. Is he at home? He went hence even now. What does he mean? Since death of my dear's mother, it did not speak before. All solemn things should answer solemn accidents. We enter Arvirigus as Cadwell with Imogen as dead, bearing her in his arms. Look, here he comes and brings the dire occasion in his arms. For it is dead that we have made so much on. I had rather have skipped from sixteen years of age to sixty, to have turned my leaping time into a crutch than have seen this. Oh, oh, sweetest, fairest lily, my brother wears thee not the one half so well as when thou grewest thyself. Thou oh, blessed thing, Jove knows what man thou mightst have made, but I thou diest, most rare boy of melancholy. How found you him? Dark, as you see, thus smiling, as some fly had tickled slumber, not as death's dart being laughed at, his right cheek reposing on a cushion. Where? On the floor, his arms thus leagued. I thought he slept and put my clouded brogues from off my feet, whose rudeness answered my steps too loud. 
Why, he but sleeps. If he be gone, he'll make his grave a bed. With female fairies will, will his tomb be haunted, and worms will not come to thee. Let us bury him and not protect with admiration what is now due debt to the grave. Say, where shall slay him? By good your file, our mother. Be it so, and let us, Polydor, through though now our voices have got the mannish crack, sing him to the ground. I cannot sing, I'll weep and word it with thee. Great griefs, I see. Medicines the less. Clotinus quite forgot. It was the queen's son, boys. Though he came our enemy, remember he was paid for that. Our foe was princely. Though you took his life as being our foe, but bury him as a prince. Pray you fetch him hither. Thersides' body is as good as Ajax when neither are alive. If you'll go fetch him, we'll say our song the whilst. Brother, begin. Exit Valerius. Fear no more the heat of the sun, nor the furious winter's rages. Though thy worldly task has done, home art gone and take thy wages. Golden lads and girls all must as chimney sweepers come to dust. Hear no more the lightning flash, nor the old dread thunderstone. Fear not slander, censure brash, thou hast finished joy and moan. All lovers young, all lovers must consign to thee and come to dust. Quiet consummation have, and renowned be thy grave. Re enter Bilarius as Morgan with the body of Clawton. We've done our obsequies. Come, lay him down. Clawton's body is placed by Emogens. Here's a few flowers put upon their faces. You were as flowers now withered, even so these herblets shall, which we upon you strew. Come on, away, apart upon our knees. The ground that gave them first has them again. Their pleasures here are past. So is their pain. Exeunt. Imogen awakes. Oh, yes, sir. To Milford Haven. Pray, how far thither? I have gone all night. Faith, I'll lay down and sleep. But soft. No bedfellow? She sees Clawton's headless body. Oh, gods and goddesses! These flowers are like the pleasures of the world, this bloody man, the care on it. I hope I dream, for so I thought I was a cave keeper and cook to honest creatures. But tis not so. It was a bolt of nothing, shot at nothing, which the brain makes of fumes. Our very eyes are sometimes like our judgments, blind. Good faith, the dream's here still. Even when I wake, it is without me as within me, not imagined, felt. The headless man? The garments of Posthumus? I know the shape of his leg. This is his hand, his foot mercurial, his martial thigh, the bronze of Hercules. But his jovial face, a murder in heaven. Now it is gone. Pisanio, all curses matted Hecuba gave thee Greeks and mine to boot be darted on thee. Thou conspired with that irregulous devil Clotten. Here, hath here cut off my lord. Thou posthumous, where is thy head? Where's that? I me, where's that? Pisanio might have killed thee at the heart and left this head on. Now, 
How should this be? Bassanio? Tis he and Clawton. Malice and Lucre in them have laid this woe here. Oh, tis pregnant, pregnant, the drug he gave me, which he said was precious and cordial to me. Have I not found it murderous to the senses? That confirms at home. This is Bassanio's deed and Clawton. Oh, oh, my lord, my lord. Imogen throws herself on top of Clawton's body and to Lucius with the captain and soldiers. To them the legions garrisoned, garrisoned in Gallia, after your will, have crossed the sea, attending you here in Milford Haven with your ships. They are here in readiness. But what from Rome? The Senate hath stirred up the confiners, and gentlemen of Italy, most willing spirits that promise noble service, and they come under the conduct of bold Yakimo with the next benefit of the wind. This forwardness makes our hopes fair. Command our present numbers be mustered. Soft ho, but what trunk is here without stop? The ruin <laughs> speaks that sometimes it was a worthy building. How a page? Or dead? Or sleeping on him? He's alive, sir. He'll then instruct us of this body. Young one, inform us of thy fortunes. Who is this that Marcus, thy bloody pillow? Or who was he that otherwise the noble nature did hath altered that good picture? What's thy interest in this sad wreck? How came it? Who is it? What art thou? I'm nothing, or if not nothing to be were better. This was my master, a very valiant Briton, and a good that here by mountaineers lies slain. Alas, there is no more such masters. I may wander from east to occident, cry out for service, try many, all good, serve truly, never find such another master. Black, good youth, thou moves no less with this complaining than thy master in bleeding. Say his name, good friend. Richard de Champ. If I do lie and do no harm by it, I hope the gods pardon me. Thy name? Fideli, sir. Thou dost uh, approve thyself the very same. Thy name well fits thy faith, thy faith, thy name. Will take thy chance with me? I will not say that shall be so well, Master, but be sure no less beloved. Pray you, go with me. I'll follow, sir. But first, and it please the gods, I'll hide my master from the flies as deep as these poor pickaxes can dig. And when with wildwood leaves and weeds I've strewed his grave, and on it said a century of prayers such as I can, twice o'er, I'll weep and sigh, and <clears throat> leaving so his service, follow you. So please, you entertain me. Ah, uh, good youth, and rather father thee than master thee. My friends, the boy hath taught us manly duties. Let us find out the prettiest daisies plot we can and make him with our pikes and partisans a grave. Come, arm him. Boy, he preferred by thee to us and he shall be interred as soldiers can. Be cheerful, wipe thine eyes, some falls our means the happier to arise. Exeunt. The soldiers carrying Quentin's body. Scene three, Britain, a room in Cymbeline's palace. Enter Cymbeline, Lord Pisanio, and attendants. Again, yeah, you bring me word how tis with her. The fever with the absence of her son. A madness of which her life's in danger. Heavens, how deeply you at once do touch me. 
Imogen, the great part of my comfort, gone. My queen upon a desperate bed and in a time when fearful wars point at me, her son gone. So needful for this present. It strikes me past the hope of comfort. But for thee, fellow, who needs must know of her departure and dost seem so ignorant, will enforce it from thee by a sharp torture. Uh, oh, 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 uh, sir, my life is yours. I humbly set it at your will. But for, my, but for my mistress, I know nothing where she remains. Why gone, nor when she proposes return? Beseech your highness, hold me your loyal servant. Good, my liege. Uh, that uh, the day that she was missing, he was here, and I, I dare be bound he's true and shall perform all parts of his subjugation loyally. For Cloten, uh, there wants no diligence in seeking him, and will no doubt be found. Time is troublesome. We'll slip you for a season, but our jealousy does yet depend. So please, Your Majesty, the Roman legions, all from Gallia drawn, are landed on your coast with a supply of Roman gentlemen by the Senate sent. Uh, the want is but to put these powers in motion that long to move. Thank you. Let's withdraw and meet the time as it seeks us. We fear not what can from Italy annoy us, but we grieve at chances here. Away. Exeunt, Pisanio remains. I heard no letter from my master since I wrote him Imogene was slain. Tis strange. Nor hear I from my mistress, who did promise to yield me often tidings. Neither know I what is betide to Cloten, but remain perplexed in all. The heavens still must work, wherein I am false, I am honest, not true to be true. These present wars shall find I love my country, even to the note of the king, or I'll fall in them. All other doubts, by time, let them be cleared. Fortune brings in some boats that are not steered. Exit Pisanio. Scene four, Wales, the forest near Bellarius's cave. Enter Bellarius as Morgan, Gideris as Polydor, and Arvirigus as Cadwall. The noise is round about us. Let us from it. What pleasure, sure. What pleasure, sir, find we in life to lock it from action and adventure? Nay, what hope have we in hiding us? Uh, this way the Romans must be, or for Britain slay us, or, or receive us for barbarous and unnatural revolts during their use, and slay us after. The sons, we'll hire to the mountains, there secure us. To the king's party there's no going, newness of Clotin's death, we being not known, not mustered among the bands, may drive us to a render where we have lived, and so extort us from that which we have done, whose answer would be death, drawn on with torture. It is not likely that when they hear the Roman horses neigh, that they will waste their time upon our note to know from whence we are. Oh, I am known of many in the army. Many years, though Clotin then be young, you see not war him from my remembrance. Besides, the king hath not deserved my service and not your loves. You find him in my exile the want of breeding, the certainty of this hard life I hopeless to have the courtesy of your cradle promised, but to be still hot summer tanglings and the shrinking slaves of winter. That be so better to cease to be. Pray, sir, to the army. I and my brother are not known. Yourself, so out of thought and thereto so o'ergrown, cannot be questioned. By this sun that shines all thither, what thing is that I never did see man die, scarce ever looked on blood, never bestrid a horse who never wore roll, nor iron in his heel? I am ashamed to look upon the holy sun, to have the benefit of his blessed beams remaining so long a poor unknown. 
By heavens, I'll go. If you will bless me, sir, and give me leave, I'll take the better care. But if you will not, the hazard therefore do fall on me by the hands of omens. So say I. Amen. No reason I. Since of your lives you set so slight a valuation, to reserve my cracked one to more care. Have with you, boys. If in your country wars you chance to die, that is my bed too. Lads, and there I'll lie. Lead, lead. The time seems long, their blood thinks scorn till fly it out and show them princes born. Exeunt, act five, scene one. Britain, the Roman camp. Enter posthumous alone, wearing Roman garments and carrying a bloody cloth. Yea, bloody cloth, I'll keep thee, for I wish thou could, thou shouldst be colored thus. O Pisanio, every good servant does not all commands, no bond but to do just ones. Gods, if you should have taken vengeance on my faults, I never had lived to put on this. So had you saved the noble Imogen to repent and struck me, wretch, more worth your vengeance. But alack, you snatch some hints for little faults, and now, dear Imogen, is your own. Do your best wills and make me blessed to obey. I am brought hither among the Italian gentry and to fight against my lady's kingdom. Tis enough that Britain I have killed thy mistress. Peace, I'll give no wound to thee. Therefore, good heavens, hear patiently my purpose. I'll disrobe me of these Italian weeds and suit myself as a Briton peasant. So I'll fight against the part I come with. So I'll die for thee, O Imogen, even for whom my life is every breath a death. And thus, unknown, pitied, nor hated, to the face of peril myself I'll dedicate. Let me make men no more valor in me than my habits show. Gods, put the strength on the Leonati in me, to shame the guise of thy world, I will begin the fashion, less without and more within. Exit Posthumus. Scene two, field of battle between the British and Roman camps. Enter Lucius, Iachimo, and the Roman army at one door, and the Briton army at another, Posthumus following like a poor soldier. They march over and go out, then enter again in skirmish. Yakimo and Posthumus, he vanquishes, he vanquishes and disarmeth Yakimo and then leaves him. The heaviness and guilt within my bosom takes off my manhood. I have belied a lady, the princess of this country, and the air on it reveringly enfeebles me. Or could this cot, a very drudge of nature's, have subdued me in my profession? Knighthoods and honors, born as I wear mine, are titles but of scorn. If that thy gentry, Britain, go before this lad as he exceeds our lords, the odds is that we scarce are men, and you are gods. Exit Yakimo. The battle continues. The Britons <coughs> fly, Cymbeline is taken. Then enter to his rescue Belarius as Morgan, Gideris as Polydor, and are vigorous as Cadwall. Stand, stand, we have the advantage of the ground. The lane is guarded, nothing routs us but the villainy of our fears. Stand! And in fight! And we enter Posthumus and seconds the Britons. They rescue Cymbeline and exit. Then enter Lucius, Iachimo, and Imogen as Fideli. Oh boy! boy. On the troops and save thyself. Or friends, kill friends, and the disorders such as war was hoodwinked. Tis their fresh supplies. It is a day turned strangely, or bedtimes let reinforce or fly. Exeunt. Scene three, another part of the field. Enter Posthumus. Today, how many would have given their honors to have saved their carcasses, took heel to do it, and yet died too? I, in mine own woe, charmed, could not find death where I did hear him groan. 
nor feel him where he struck. Being an ugly monster, tis strange he hides him in fresh cups, soft beds, sweet words, or hath more ministers than we that draw his knives in the war. Well, I will find him, for being now a favorer to the Briton, no more a Briton. He removes his peasant costume. I have resumed again the part I came in. Fight I will no more, but yield me to the veriest hind that shall once touch my, soul, my shoulder. Great the slaughter is here made by the Roman. Great the answer be Britons, Britons must take. For me, my ransom's death. On either side, I come to spend my breath, which neither here I'll keep nor bear again, but end it by some means for Imogen. Enter first and second British captain and soldiers. Great Jupiter be praised, Lucius is taken. Tis thought the old man and his sons were angels. There was a fourth man in a silly habit that gave the affront with them. So tis reported, but none of them can be found. Sand, who's there? A Roman. Seize, lay hands on him, a dog. A leg of Rome shall not return to tell what crows have pecked them here. Bring him to the king. Enter Cymbeline, attendants Valerius as Morgan, Ceteris as Polydor, Arvirigus as Codwell, Pisanio, soldiers and Roman captives. The captives, the captains present Posthumus to Cymbeline, who delivers him over to a jailer. Jailer leads him off. Exeunt. Scene four, Britain, a prison. Enter Posthumus in chains. Oh, most welcome bondage, for thou art away, I think, to liberty. Death is the key to unbar these locks. My conscience, thou art fettered more than my shanks and wrists. You good gods, give me the penitent instrument to pick that bolt and free forever. Is it enough? I am sorry. So children, temporal fathers do appease. Gods are more full of mercy. Must I repent? I cannot do it better than in jives, desired more than constrained. To satisfy for Imogen's dear life, take mine. And though tis not so dear, yet tis a life. You coined it. Between man and a man, they weigh not every stamp, though light. Take pieces for the figure's sake. You rather mine being yours and, and so great powers. If you will take this audit, take this life and cancel these cold bonds. Oh, Imogen, I'll speak to thee in silence. He lies down and sleeps. Solemn music. Enter, as in an apparition, Cecilius Leonatus, father to Posthumus, an old man attired like a warrior. No more. Thou thunder master, show thy spite on mortal flies. Hath my poor boy done aught but well, whose face I never saw? I died whilst in the womb he stayed, attending nature's law. Whose father then, as men report, the thou orphan's father's art, art. Thou shouldest have been and shielded him from this earth vexing smart. When once he was mature for man, in Britain where he was, that could stand up his parallel, or fruitful object be, in eye of Imogen, that best could deem his dignity. With marriage, wherefore was he mocked, to be exiled and thrown from Leonati's seat, and cast from her his dearest one. Sweet Imogen, why did you suffer Iachimo, slight thing of Italy, to taint his nobler heart and brain with needless jealousy, and to become the geck and scorn of the other's villainy? Like Hardiment Posthumus hath to Cymbeline performed, striking in his country's cause. Then, Jupiter, thou king of gods, why hast thou thus adjourned the graces for this his merits due, being all two dollars turned? Since, Jupiter, my son is good, take off his miseries, peep through thy marble mansion, help 
or we poor ghosts will cry to the shining synod of the rest against thy deity. Help, Jupiter, or we appeal and from thy justice fly. Thunder and lightning crash, an eagle flies. Cecilius disappears and Posthumus awakes with a start. Leap, thou hast been a grandsire and begot a father to me. But, oh, scorn, he, he is gone. He went hence so soon as he was born. And so I am awake. Poor wretches that depend on greatness favor dream as I have done. Wake and find nothing. But, alas, I swerve. Many dream not to find, neither deserve, and yet are steeped in favors. So am I that have this golden chance and know not why. Enter the jailer. Come, sir, are you ready for death? Over-roasted, rather. Uh, hanging is the word, sir. If you be ready for that, you are well cooked. So, if I prove a good repast to the spectators, the dish pays the shot. A heavy reckoning for you, sir. But the comfort is you shall be called to no more payments. Fear no more tavern bills, which are often the sadness of parting as the procuring of mirth. Oh, the charity of a penny cord. It, 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 it sums up thousands in a trice. You have no true debtor and creditor, but it of what's past. Uh, is and to come the discharge. Your neck, sir, is pen, book, and counters. So the acquaintance follows. I am merrier to die than thou art to live. Indeed, sir, he that sleeps feels not the toothache, but a man that were to sleep your sleep and a hangman to help him to bed, I think he would change places with his officer. For look, sir, you know not what, you know, you know not which way you shall go. Yes, indeed I do, fellow. You must either be directed by some that take upon them to know, or to take upon yourself that which I am sure you do not know, or jump the after inquiry on your own peril. And how you shall speed in your journey's end, I think you'll never return to tell one. I tell thee, fellow, there are none want eyes to direct them the way I am going, but such as wink and will not use them. What an infinite mock is this, that a man should have the best use of eyes to see the way of blindness. I am sure hanging's way of winking. Enter a messenger. Knock off his manacles, bring your prisoner to the king. <laughs> Thou bringest good news. I am called to be made free. I'll be hanged then. He removes <laughs> Posthumus's chains. Thou shalt be then freer than a jailer. Exeunt with Posthumus following the messenger. Scene five, <laughs> Cymbeline's tent. Enter Cymbeline, uh, Bellarius as Morgan, Gideris as Polydor, Arvirigus as Cadwall, Pisanio attendants and lords. By my side, you whom the gods have made preservers of my throne. Woe is my heart that the poor soldier that so richly fought, whose rags shame the gilded arms, whose naked breast stepped before targes of proof, cannot be found. He shall be happy that can find him, if our grace can make him so. I never saw such noble fury in so poor a thing. Such precious deeds in one that promised naught but beggary and poor looks. No tidings of him? He hath been searched among the dead and living, but no trace of him. My grief, I am the heir of this reward, which I will add to you, the liver, heart, and brain of Britain, by whom I grant she lives. Tis now the time to ask of whence you are. Report it. Sir, in Cambria we were born, and gentlemen, further to boast, were neither true nor modest, unless I add we are honest. 
Bow your knees. They kneel, he taps their shoulders with his sword. Rise, thy knights of the battle. I create you companions to our person and will fit you with dignities becoming your estates. They rise. Enter Cornelius with the queen's ladies. Hail, There's great business king. in these faces. There's business in these faces. Uh, why so sadly greet you our victory? You look like Romans and not of the court of Britain. Hail, great king. To sour your happiness, I must, I must report. The queen is dead. How oh, did she? With horror, madly dying, like her life, which, being cruel to the world, concluded most cruel to herself. What she confessed I will report, so please you. These her women can trip me if I err, and with wet cheeks were present when she finished. Pretty. Say. First, she confessed she never loved you, only affected greatness got by you, not you. Married your royalty, was wife to your place, and abhorred your person. You all knew this, but she spoke it dying. I would not believe her lips in opening it. Proceed. Your daughter, whom she bore in hand to love with such integrity, she did confess was as a scorpion to her sight, whose life, but that her flight prevented, she had taken off by poison. Delicate fiend! Who, who is it can read a woman? Is there more? More, sir, and worse. She did confess she had for you a mortal mineral which, being took, should by the minute feed on life and lingering by inches waste you. In which time she purposed by watching, weeping, tendance, kissing, to overcome you with her show, and in time when she had fitted you with her craft, to work her son into the adoption of the crown. But failing of her end by his strange absence, grew shameless, desperate, opened in despite of heaven and men her purposes, repented the evil she hatched, were not affected, and so despairingly she died. My eyes were not in fault, for she was beautiful. My ears that hurt her flattery, nor my heart that I thought her like her seeming. It had been vicious to have mistrusted her. Yet, oh, my daughter, that it was folly in me, thou mayst say, and prove it in thy feeling. Heaven mend all. Enter Lucius, Iachimo, and other Roman prisoners, and posthumous behind. Imogen as Fideli, with Britain soldiers as guards. Thou comest not, Chaos, now for tribute. But the Britons have raised out, though with the loss of many a bold one, whose kinsmen have made suit that their good souls may be appeased with slaughter of you, their captives, which our self have granted. So think of your estate. Consider, sir, the chance of war. The day was yours by accident. Had it gone with us, we should not, when the blood was cool, have threatened our prisoners with a sword. But since the gods will have it thus, that nothing but our lives may be called ransom, let it come. This only I will entreat. My boy, a, a Briton board, let him be ransomed. Never master had a page so kind so duteous, diligent, so tender over his occasions, true, so feet, so nurse-like. Let his virtue join with my request, which I make bold your highness cannot deny. He hath done no Britain harm, though he has saved a Roman. Save him, sir, and spare no blood beside. 
I have surely seen him. His favour is familiar to me. Boy, thou hast looked thyself into my grace and art my own. I know not why, wherefore, to say live, boy, ne'er thank thy master. Live and, and ask of Cymbeline what boon thou wilt, fitting my bounty and thy state. I'll give it. Yea, though thou do demand a prisoner, the noblest tan. I humbly thank your highness. I do not bid thee beg my life, good lad, and yet I know thou wilt. No, no, alack, there's other work in hand. Your life, good master, must shuffle for itself. The boy disdains me. He leaves me, scorns me. Briefly dies their joys that place them on the truth of girls and boys. Why stands he so perplexed? What wouldst thou, boy? I love thee more and more. Think uh, more and more what's best to ask. Knowst him thou look'st on? Speak. Wilt have him live? Is he thy kin? My friend? He is a Roman, no more kin to me than I to your highness, who, being born your vassal, am something near. Wherefore iced him so? I'll tell you, sir, in private, if you please to give me hearing. I, with all my heart, and lend my best attention. What's thy name? Fideli, sir. Thou art my good youth, my page. I'll be thy master. Walk with me. Speak freely. Not this boy revived from death? One sand, another no more resembles that sweet rosy lad who died and was Fideli. What think you? Same dead thing alive. Peace, peace. See further. He eyes us not. Forbear. Creatures may be alike. Were he, I'm sure he would have spoke to us. But we see him dead. Be silent. Let's further see. Sanyo. It is my mistress, and she is living. Let the time run on to good or bad. Come, stand thou by our side. Make thy demand aloud. Sir, step you forth. Give answer to this boy and do it freely. Or by our greatness and the grace of it, which is our honor, Bitter torture shall winnow the truth from falsehood. On, speak to him. My boon is that this gentleman may render of whom he had this ring. Oh, uh, what's that to him? That diamond upon your finger, say how came it yours. Thou would torture me to leave unspoken that which to be spoke would torture thee. How? Oh. Me? I am glad to be constrained to utter that which torments me to conceal. By villainy I got this ring, t'was Leonatus' jewel, which thou dost banish, and which more may grieve thee as it doth me, a nobler sir never lived. Twixt sky and ground, that paragon, my daughter, for whom my heart drops blood, and these false spirits quail to remember, Give me leave, I faint. My daughter? What of her? Renew thy strength. I had rather thou shouldst live while nature will than die ere I hear more. Strive, man, and speak. What should I say? He was too good to be where ill men were, and was the best of all amongst the rarest of good ones, sitting sadly, hearing us praise our loves of Italy, for beauty that made barren the swell boost of him that best could speak, 
for feature, laming the shrine of Venus or straight pite Minerva, postures beyond brief nature for condition, a shop of all the qualities that man loves woman for, besides that hook of wiving, most like a noble lord in love, and one that had a loyal lover, took his hint, and not dispraising whom he praised, therein he was as calm as virtue, he began his mistress's picture, which by his tongue being made, and then a mind put in either our brags, which cracked our kitchen trolls, or his description proved us unspeaking sots. Nay, nay, to the purpose. Your daughter's chastity, there it begins. He spake of her as Dean had hot dreams, and she alone were cold, where eat I, wretch, made scruple of his praise, and waged with him pieces of gold against this, which then he wore upon his honored finger, to attain in suit the place of his bed, and win this ring by hers and mine adultery. He, true knight, no lesser of her honor confident than I did truly find her, stakes this ring, post I in this design. Well, you, sir, may remember me at court, where I was taught of your chaste daughter with wide difference twixt amorous and villainous, being thus quenched of hope, not longing mine Italian brain gan in your duller Britain operate most vilely, my practice so prevailed that I returned the similar proof enough to make the noble Leonatus mad by wounding his belief in her renown with tokens thus and thus, averting notes of chamber hanging, pictures, this, her bracelets. Oh, cunning, how I got it. Nay, some marks of secret of her person that he could not but think her bond of chastity quite cracked. I, having taken the forfeit, whereupon, methinks I see him now. Ay, so thou dost, Italian fiend. I, me, most credulous fool, sure. egregious murderer, thief, anything that's due to all the villains past in being to come. Oh, give me cord or knife or poison, some upright justicer. Thou, king, send out for torturers in genius. It is I that all the abhorred things of the earth amend by being worse than they. I am Postumus, that killed thy daughter, villain-like I lie, that caused a lesser villain than myself, a sacrilegious thief, to do it. The temple of virtue was she. Yea, and she herself spit and throw stones, cast mire upon me, set the dogs of the street to bay me. Every villain be called posthumous Leonatus, and be villainy less than twas. Oh, Imogen, my queen, my li my my life, my wife. Oh, Imogen, Imogen, Imogen. Peace, my lord, here, here. Ah, oh, shouts have a play of this. Thou scornful page, there lie thy part. Oh, gentlemen, help mine and your mistress. Oh, my lord Posthumus, you never killed Imogen till now. Help, help, mine honored lady. Does the world go round? How comes these staggers on me? Wake my mistress. If this be so, the gods do me to strike me to death with mortal joy. How fair well, is my mistress? Get me from my sight. Thou gavest me poison, a dangerous fellow hence. The tune of emotion. Oh, lady, the gods throw stones of sulfur on me if that box I gave you was not thought by me a precious thing. I had it from the queen. Matter still. It poisons me. Oh. Oh. Oh, gods. I left out one thing which the queen confessed, which must have proved the honest. 
if Pisanio have, said she, given his mistress that confection which I serve him for cordial, she is served as I would serve a rat. What's this, Cornelius? The queen, sir, very oft importuned me to temper poisons for her, still pretending the satisfaction of her knowledge only in killing creatures vile as cats and dogs. Of no esteem, I, dreading that her purpose was of more danger, did compound for her a certain stuff which, being taken, would cease the present power of life. But in short time, all offices of nature would again be of do their due functions. Have you taken of it? Most like I did, for I was dead. Boys, there was our error. This is sure fidelity. Why did you throw your wedded lady from you? Think that you are upon a rock, and they'll throw me again. Oh, hang there like fruit, my soul, till the tree die. Oh, no, my flesh, my child. What makes thou me a, me a dullard in this act? Will thou not speak to me? Your blessing, sir. <laughs> Though you did love this youth, I blame you not. You had a motive for it. My tears that that fall prove holy water on thee, Imogene. Thy mother's dead. I am sorry for it, my lord. No, she was not. And long of her it was that we meet here so strangely. But her son is gone. We know not how nor where. My lord, now fear is from me. I speak truth. Lord Cloten, upon my lady's missing, came to me with his sword drawn, foamed at the mouth, and swore if I discovered not which way she was gone, it was my instant death. <clears throat> By accident, I had a feigned letter of my master's then in my pocket, which directed him to seek her on the mountains near to Milford, where any frenzy in my master's garments, which he enforced from me, away he posts with unchaste purpose and with oath to violate my lady's honor. What became of him, I further know not. Let me end the story. I slew him there. Marry, the gods for ten. I, I would not thy good deed should from my lips pluck a hard sentence. Prithee, valiant youth, deny it again. I have spoken and I did it. It was the prince. A most uncivil one. The wrongs he did me were nothing prince-like, for he did provoke me with language that would make me spurn the sea if it could so roar to me. I cut off his head and am right glad he is not standing here to tell this tale of mine. I have sorrow for thee. For thine own tongue thou art condemned and must endure our law. Thou art dead. Bind the offender and take him from our presence. Stay, uh, sir. King, this man is better than the man he slew, and well descended as thyself, and hath more of thee merited than a band of clottons have ever scar for. Let him's arms alone, they were not born for bondage. Our descent as good as we. In that he spake too far. Thou shalt die for it. My sons. I must, for my own part, unfold a dangerous speech, though happily well for you. Your danger's ours. Our good his. I've had it then. I leave thou hast a great king, a subject, who was called Belarius. I love him. He is a banished traitor. He it is that hath assumed this age. Indeed, a banished man. I know not how a traitor. 
Eight and hence, the whole world shall not save him. Not too hot. Pay me for the nursing of thy sons, and let it be confiscated all so soon as I have received it. Nursing of my sons? I, I am too blunt and saucy. Here's my knee. These two young gentlemen that call me father and think they are my sons are none of mine. They are the issue of your loins, my liege, and blood of your begetting. How? Oh, my issue? So sure as your father's I, old Morgan, I am that Belarius whom you sometime banished. Your pleasure was my mere offense. My punishment itself and all my treason that I suffered was all the harm I did. These gentle princes, for such they are, these twenty years have I trained up. Those arts that they have as I could put them into, my breeding, sir, was as your highness knows. Their nurse, you're a file. Whom for the theft I wed, stole these children upon my banishment. I moved it to her, having received the punishment before that which hath that which I did then. Beaten for the loyalty, excited me to treason. Their dear loss, the more of you twas felt, the more it shaped unto my end of stealing them. But gracious sir, here are your sons again. And I must lose two of the sweetest companions in all the world. These benedictions of these covering heavens fall on their heads like dew, for they are worthy to inlay heaven with stars. Thou weepst and speaks. The service that you three have done is more unlike than this thou tellst. I lost my children. If these be they, I know not how to wish a pair of worthier sons. Be pleased a while. This gentleman who I call Polydor, a most, a most worthy prince, as yours is true, Jadirius. This gentleman, my Codwall, Aravagus, your younger princely son, he, sir, was lapped up. He, sir, was lapped in most curious mantle, wrought by the hand of his queen mother, for which more probation I can, I can with ease produce. Darius had upon his neck a mole, a sanguine star. It was a mark of wonder. This is he whom hath upon him still that natural stamp. It was wise nature's end in the donation to be his evidence now. Oh, what am I, a mother to the birth of three? Ne'er a mother be joy's deliverance more. Lest pray you be that after this strange starting from your orbs, you may reign in them now. Oh, Imogen, thou hast lost by this a kingdom. No, my lord. I've got two worlds by it. Oh, my gentle brothers, have we thus met? I'll never say hereafter, but I am truest speaker. You called me brother when I was but your sister. Ah, you brothers, when we were so indeed. Did you wear meat? I am my good lord. <laughs> and at first meeting, love continued so until we thought he died. Unmute. By the queen's dram she swallowed. Oh, rare instinct. When shall I hear all through? This fierce abridgment hath to its circumstantial branches which distinction should be rich in. Where? How lived you? And, and when came you to serve our Roman captive? How parted with your brothers? How first met them? Why fled you from the court, and, and whither? These, and, and your three motives to the battle with, uh, I, I know not how much more, 
should be demanded and all the other bi-dependences from chance to chance. Let's quit this ground. Thou art my brother, so we'll hold thee ever. You are my father, too, and did relieve me to see this gracious season. All are joyed. Save these in bonds. Let them be joyful, too. And they shall taste our comfort. Imogen unties Lucius. My good master, I will yet do you service. Happy be you. Poor Lord soldier that so nobly fought. He would have well become this place and graced the thankings of a king. Posthumus. Uh, I, I am, sir, the soldier that did company these three in poor beseeming. T'was a fitment for the purpose I then followed, that I was he. Speak, Giacomo. I had you down and might have made you finish. I am down again, but now my heavy conscience sinks my knee, and then your force did. Take that life, beseech you, which I so often owe, but your ring first, and hear the bracelet of the truest princess that ever swore her faith. He holds out the ring and bracelet. Kneel not to me. The power that I have on you is to spare you, the malice towards you to forgive you. Live and deal with others better. Don't be doomed. We'll learn our freeness of the son-in-law. Pardons the word to all. Yakimo rises. You hope us, sir, as you did mean indeed to be our brother. Joyed are we that you are. Uh, your servant, princes. My peace, we will begin. And Caius Lucius, although the victor, we submit to Caesar and to the Roman Empire, promising to pay our wanted tribute from the which we were dissuaded by our wicked queen, whom heavens in justice, both on her and hers, have laid most heavy hand. Lord, we the gods, and let our crooked smokes climb to their nostrils from our blessed altars. Publish we this peace to all our subjects. Set me forward. Let a Roman and a British ensign wave friendly together. So through Ludstown March and in the temple of great Jupiter, our peace we'll ratify. Seal it with feasts. Set on there. Never was a war did cease ere bloody hands were washed with such a peace. Exeunt. End of play. <laughs> Boy, the, the scenes sure showed in that play. <laughs> <laughs>